Dr. Dude. Fatality. Sneaking in before it all starts. Blaming the dinosaurs. Hey, Daddy. Hey, Chad. Oh, all out there.
it squats completely flat. The bone wall is so thin, it's about the same dimension as the wall of a dirter. A dirter is one of those things you get at the end of the paper towels, the cardboard thing in the middle, you go dirt, dirt, dirt. Well, that's what this thing is like. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. DDDs plus Q&A equals great place to start the week. the most remarkable animals that had ever existed, and certainly one of the most famous, is a dinosaur.
you were saying? It's in the cupboard. No, no the one by your knees. Vincent, we happy? Yeah, we happy. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. Let me adjust the volume here. Hopefully, that's an acceptable level right now. But welcome, welcome, everybody. It is great to have you here. Holy cow, happy Monday to you. Hope you all had a wonderful, wonderful weekend. And I hope you're ready to uh, talk about some fossils today. It's so lovely to see everybody here in chat, and uh, I'm glad you could make it today. We're going to have a fun, kind of relaxed stream. We don't have, like, a big topic to talk about, but we'll be doing some dinosaur deep dives. Probably talk about some fossil news, and... Uh, it's been a pretty freewheeling kind of a broadcast, even more so than usual. If anybody's here for the very first time, by the way, an extra special welcome to you. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. So what does that mean on a place like Twitch? Well, it means taking questions live from the viewers. It means going over some of the latest fossil news. Talking about new discoveries in the field of paleontology. And, uh, yeah, just generally trying to give you an inside peek into how fossil science works. You know, I think our world would be a better place if more scientists had the opportunity to actually reach out to the public and talk about their work and try and demystify science for regular folks. That's what I'm trying to do here. So if that sounds interesting to you, then I hope you stick around. We're going to have a lot of fun today. And, uh, so I'm glad you could make it. But before we get into any dinosaur deep dives, or any fossil news, or anything of that sort, uh, let's scroll up to the top real quick and, uh, say hello to everybody. Oh, I, and I mentioned already that it, I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, right? That's why I'm doing this in the first place. I'm not just talking about my own field work and research, going out digging up dinosaurs at various museums across the American West. You know, publishing on dinosaurs in the scientific literature, that kind of thing. I'm also, uh, well, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> but now five days a week on Twitch, this is actually how I make my living, believe it or not. Talking to folks about, about fossils. With a strong emphasis on dinosaurs, of course. You probably know already that a paleontologist is a scientist who studies dinosaurs, er, a scientist who studies fossils, excuse me. I studied dinosaur fossils in particular, hence dinosaur paleontologist. Most paleontologists don't work on dinosaurs, despite what many members of the public think. Dinosaurs are just but one small corner of the vast, vast pantheon of different organisms preserved as fossils that paleontologists study. Paleontologists can study any kinds of critters from fossil plants, fossil diatoms, fossil insects, mammals, fungi, fossil pollen. There are paleontologists who specialize in fossilized droppings, fossilized dung. You know, if something is preserved as a fossil, you know, the, the fossilized remains of, of a once living thing or the traces that it left behind, then there is a paleontologist who studies that thing, you know? Um, so yeah, yeah. But I work on dinosaurs in particular, so I suppose I'm not really helping with that whole, uh, Stereotype? Archetype? So I like to give a disclaimer every time I remember. Anyway, we'll see who's here. Travel the world, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. I seem to have lost the very top of chat, but I believe... Uh, give them Nell and Golganek and Kodali and Jody Fish were all there. So welcome to all of you. Early, early birds. It's wonderful to see. I hope you had a, a lovely weekend. Welcome back. We're starting the week off right. Right now. Uh, Science Stream says, Hi, friends. Hi, Professor Andrews. How are you doing, Bolinth? Welcome, welcome. I'm running a conference, so mostly lurking as I enjoy some dinosaur content. 
Welcome, Science. Balance, I, uh... I hope the conference is going really well. Holy cow. Running a conference? Are you doing that from home? Or remotely? Or... I don't know. Shoot. That's pretty awesome, though. Science streams. And again... Standard, standard disclaimer. If any of you are not yet following Science Streams, you're missing out. Go follow Balint and Lita and baby Ilona right now uh, for some the best quality science content on Twitch. Holy cow. Yeah. Moondrop Soup, how are you doing? Welcome. Welcome. Arlay0501. Arlay, hope you had a good weekend. It's good to see you. Uh, Vicky Sky, what's shaking with you? Good to see you too. Yeah. And uh, XF Kirsten, thank you for the 21 months of support. Really appreciate that. Trying to make my way down through chat, get down to the bottom. FMSSK, good vibes inbound. Yeah, now that you're here, welcome, FMSSK. Good to have you. Vigilanta, what's shaking? Great to see you. Uh, uh, and I'm sorry you've got a headache, Jody Fish. Shoot. Well, if there's anything I can do for you, let me know, okay? Yeah. Uh, and uh, who else do we have got? Uh, Tank TR 2004 says, I love the surf music. It's always so good. Thank you, Tank. It's great to have you back. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Uh, Mudman, howdy, howdy. Good to see you. Yeah. Uh, and Lenina, how are you doing, Lenina? I hope your weekend was wonderful, too. It's always great to see you, Lenina. Hope things are good. And you won your hockey game last night? 3D printed lightsaber over the weekend? Holy cow, X of Kirsten. You've been busy. Uh, times to sand, prime, and paint now. Very nice, Kirsten. We're working on a 3D print of our own today. Ooh. Anybody guess what that is? I may have actually mentioned this in the going live message. But, uh, yeah. Anyway. Vampir says, hi, Danny, and everyone in chat. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you, too, Vampir. Welcome, welcome. Octavius, thank you so much for the nine months of support. Octavius, really appreciate that. I really, really do. Pretty excellent. Yeah. Uh, and we had a hype train going there. Beautiful. Very nice. Travel the world, thank you for uh, gifting a subscription to a poinsettia. Thank you. Thank you, Travel. Really appreciate that. Appreciate you very much, Travel. Thank you, thank you. Holy cow. Duck Admirer says, Dinosaurs are so good, and there's a macaw. Dinosaurs are so good, Duck Admirer. As an admirer of ducks, you already know that uh, the birds are dinosaurs. So yeah, I don't have to tell you that, Duck Admirer. It's great to have you here. <laughs> um, and Invisible Dimensions, thank you for the 19 months. Holy cow. That's fantastic. It really is. Shy Game Boy. How are you doing? I don't recognize that name. Is it your first time, Shy Game Boy? Welcome, welcome. Or maybe you've lurked before and haven't said anything on account of the shyness. But at any rate, I'm glad you're here, Shy Game Boy. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you. Yeah. Uh, and let's see. Give Them Nell is coming up with some sort of a scheme for befriending a group of neighborhood crows. Uh, is that... Be careful with that. <laughs> But, yeah. Man, there's a story that I read about that with a woman who would, like, feed crows. Or she she rescued a baby crow or something like that. She, like, put it back into its nest. And then the crows took notice. And then they befriended her. And then any time that her neighbors would come over to talk, the crows would mob them. They're, like, trying to defend her. So you never know what crows are going to do, you know? They're very social animals. They're very intelligent. They've got big personalities. Yeah. And, uh... Let's see... Is this is THE scene, now. Well, you know now what I did with it. Tommy Platagus, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Dismodus, I hope you uh, enjoyed the cold open video there. Yeah. Um, and my weekend was good, Gianmi. My weekend was really good. Yeah. Got a lot of stuff done. It was nice. Nature's Compendium is back, too. How are you doing, Nature's Compendium? Welcome, welcome. I hope all is well. It's good to see you. Yeah. Uh, and Rilo Rolo, the big kahuna burger scene? Uh, that was just before. I didn't, yeah. Well, there's, there's cuss words in that. I can't show the whole thing. Also, it's just, I gotta make some modifications if it's gonna be 
you know, fair use. It's a family-friendly channel, you know. Gotta insert some paleontology and that sort of thing, yeah. Darian Beagle says you're a science communicator. I am indeed, Darian Beagle. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. And Rila Rolo, gotta get up in six hours. Oh, holy cow, Rila Rolo. You should get some sleep if you have to get up in six hours. Holy cow. I, I know... I, I appreciate that you're excited about science, but holy moly, you gotta get some sleep also. Yeah. Pro Scion, yo to you, how you doing? Welcome, welcome. And, uh... And Smay says, Archosaurs seem strange to you compared to their descendants? I mean, their descendants are also Archosaurs, though, Smay. Crocodiles and birds are Archosaurs. So are dinosaurs. Um... We could talk about them in a, in a minute. Remind me, Smay, if I forget, and we'll talk about archosaurs and where they fit in on the Tree of Life and all that good stuff. Um, and Paleonard Italiano says, Guess what? I've got a fever, and the only prescription is more dinosaurs. Well, Paleonard, I think you will soon be cured. Um, it's good to have you here, Paleonard. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Uh, uh, you won't spoil it for anyone, though? Thank you, Kirsten. <laughs> won't spoil what's a 3D printer. So somebody else is welcome to guess. It doesn't look like it right now. Like, it doesn't look like the thing it's going to be. Uh, there's no real way to guess it. You just kind of have to look at the going live message. But yeah. Um. A very funny cephalon wolf with a pun there. Is that a pun? Or is that wordplay? Or is it just... An old-fashioned joke. I don't know what, how you would characterize that. It's not very much a pun. Is it? I'd say it's wordplay. I like that cephalon wolf. Uh, and crows can make weapons. Crows are extraordinarily intelligent animals. They have rich social lives. They're very cool critters. Uh, and Kimuri Darake says, Sup, Commander. How are you doing, Kimuri? How are things? Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Darian Beagle says that's what Stephen Jay Gould was, a science communicator. I mean, and a, an evolutionary biologist, you know? A, I think he was a professor also at, um, at Columbia University, I want to say. New York City. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, but yeah, Stephen Gould did do, uh, Steve Gould did do a lot of science communication for sure. Yeah. And Dilophosaurus video got... Very nice, Nature's Compendium. Very, very nice. Yeah. Um, I was working on a Dilophosaurus video ages ago, and I never ended up finishing it. But, uh... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did I tell you Nature's Compendium? I got to to work on the, the Dilophosaurus holotype when I was in high school at Berkeley. Like, the only decent skull of Dilophosaurus in the world. Uh, I got to work on that. It was, uh... It's pretty cool, yeah. The uh, the plastic, um, you know, like the acrylic uh, things in the middle here. It showed up in Brian Eng's video. Um, yeah. It's all the way up into the crest. The crest is hollow. Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, looking for that. Yeah, there we go. This, these are Pat Holroyd's hands. Pat was my mentor there at Berkeley. And, uh, yeah. This thing is so incredibly delicate that it actually needs, like, acrylic rods right here to help support it, to keep it from, from twisting and torquing. The crest itself is incredibly thin. Like, I've said this many times before, but it's, like, potato chip thin. Um, just... You can see light passing through it. It's that thin. Just crazy. Like, that's... This is at an angle, so it looks thicker than it is, but, I mean, yeah. It's it's like a potato chip. Or a crisp, you would say, in a Commonwealth country, I suppose. Godzilla enthusiast. Welcome, Godzilla enthusiast. How you doing? It's good to have you here. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh... And isn't that Dilophosaurus skull flattened? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was crushed and distorted, and there's all kinds of diagenetic things that happened to it. But, uh, yeah. 
It's definitely... <laughs> uh, yeah, it's definitely seen better days. I mean, the thing's 195 million years old. Give or take a few. Um, but yeah. Anyway, great video from Brian Eng on this. And I guess Nature's Compendium's got a new one, too. Very nice. Yeah. So, yeah. It was taken out of the ground like that? It was taken out of the ground in multiple pieces, Cephalon Wolf. No, it uh, it had to be pieced back together. It's a process that took years. And then it was sitting in collections, and it was kind of deteriorating there in collections. So I'd be pieced back together again afterward, and uh, I was lucky enough to be able to help with that a little bit when I was in high school, which is really cool. So, yeah. Yeah. How, Spain how painstaking was that to dig out? I think they had limited time when Sam Wells and co. were digging that thing out back in the 40s. I think that might have been 1940 or 1942. Um, yeah, it was... Uh, <laughs> it was tough going. Yeah. Um, you know, there are some... I think the only photos that I know of that are... Uh, are on the UCMP website, which the UCMP website, this webpage on Dilophosaurus is one of the oldest dinosaur webpages in existence that's still extant. This has been around since, what, 1995 or something? Um, yeah, there we go. There are some photos there uh, of the initial excavation. And this was intended to be like a, like a museum exhibit online at the time, back when this was put together in, like, 1995. And so you click these, and it downloads a, uh, a little audio file to your hard drive, and then you can play it through an audio player. And it's actually uh, Samuel P. Wells, who named Dilophosaurus. Uh, it's him narrating all of this, which is really cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, originally, he originally named it Megalosaurus Weatherly. We talked all about Megalosaurus last week. Uh, so yeah, check the, uh, the YouTube page if you missed that, by the way. Um. There we go. I've started putting, this year was my, one of my New Year's resolutions to put all of the VODs. All the recordings of Twitch streams onto YouTube. So February 20th, we did Megalosaurus. This was last Monday, I believe. Um, yeah. And where is that Megalosaur jaw? Anyway, it's somewhere in here. Mm. Yeah, there we oh. Merp. Yeah, you're probably familiar with that image there. I now have a 3D print of the very same element. I contacted the folks at the Oxford Museum of Natural History, and uh, I got the files so I could 3D print the holotype Megalosaurus dentary. This is the right lower jaw of this animal. Uh, going right up until about the symphysis right there, it would join with the other, uh, with the other jaw. But yeah, pretty cool. Still got to, uh, sand this and smooth it and paint it. But very, very proud to have that, and it's gonna be a wonderful teaching aid. So yeah, yeah. Um, and that, I guess that was previously recorded Danny making an appearance there, huh? Yeah. Uh, he's just irrepressible. And he's wearing the same shirt as me today. Holy cow. This is one week ago today. I guess that's my laundry schedule demystified. But, uh, yeah. Cephalon Wolf says, could anyone in theory request said files? I think, I mean, they're supposed to be available for researchers and for people doing science outreach. Um, definitely not for commercial purposes. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway. And Dinosaur Dave, um, and Dinosaur Dave, I'm glad you found a, a place to live. That's really tough when, when you're looking. I remember that 
when I moved back to California. Um, yeah, that's that's tricky. I'm glad you found a place, Dinosaur Dave. And uh, yeah, nicely done. I hope I really hope it works out for you. Yeah, and uh, Indiana Jones outfit vigilant. It's just it's a military surplus shirt, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, most of my, my field shirts are military surplus, uh, because they're inexpensive, they're durable, they're already kind of earth-toned, so they don't show dirt all that well. Uh, like, they tend to hide dirt pretty well, I should say. It's a more positive way of putting that. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. They're, they're inexpensive enough where if I have to tear the sleeves off of a shirt or cut a shirt up in order to help build a plaster jacket for an important fossil specimen if we run out of burlap or something like that then it's not the end of the world you know um i don't really shop at like outdoor stores because i don't have the budget for that you know no 50 dollar uh like oh 50 dollar spf highly technical camping hiking shirt it's like that stuff is usually not very durable anyway it tends to get all torn up so yeah, these shirts, they've got a, a limited lifespan anyway. They're gonna get destroyed after a few field seasons. So you might as well get something that's fairly durable, but also cheap, you know? Because you're gonna have to replace it. The kind of work that I do. Hmm. So many pockets. There you go, Kirsten. I don't wear pants in the field, though. Especially not BDU pants. I'm a shorts guy. Um, yeah. I'm actually wearing long pants right now. Here, I'll show you my knee. Ready? Here. Uh, I am wearing long pants today. See? Um, that's just because it's cold out today. Uh, yeah. But if I'm out in the field, that generally means it's summertime. In the Rocky Mountain West, and it gets hot out there in places. Shoot, last summer when I was out working in eastern Utah, it got up past 110, like, on the regular. There was, like, a whole week when it was, like, 110 every day. Um, yeah, it'll, it probably got hotter than that, but I didn't have a thermometer out there. So, yeah, anyway. Uh, and Nature's Compendium, well, thank you. Nature's Compendium says, went ahead and shared your VOD channel to my community tab. Hope that helps. Thank you, Nature's Compendium. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Solidarity. Appreciate you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, yeah. I've not done a, a lot of stuff on YouTube recently. Uh, I used to make, you know, really go big with the YouTube videos, but... I don't know. Twitch is a, a niche that just works so much better for me. And I'm really happy here. So if, if posting my VODs to YouTube, like I've been doing, can bring new people into the community and get more people interested in science, and, you know, then we all, then we all win, Nature's Compendium. So thank you, thank you. I really appreciate uh, you doing that. That's generous of you. Uh, and how often do I go into the field these days? The last time I was out in the field was October. But it's usually, that's kind of unusual for me. Usually it'll be June through like late August I'll be in the field something like that and that's what I plan for this next summer yeah so June of 2023 to August of 2023 and I am uh I'm actually waiting on they still haven't responded it's been uh it's been almost a week now I haven't heard back from Starlink customer support, but I'm having some issues with my Starlink unit. And, um... Yeah. I'm hopefully going to be using satellite internet to broadcast live from the field multiple, multiple times this summer uh, to be able to show you firsthand what it's like to dig dinosaurs out in, uh, in western Wyoming and eastern Utah. And who knows, maybe even Montana, too. I still have to figure that out. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to be digging up some more dinosaurs this summer, and I hope to live stream it. That's the goal. That's the idea. So, uh, 
Stay tuned for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Why not go in spring slash autumn? Since birds are dead on. You know, I think I have... Well, it's not on this hard drive. Shoot. I did a an interview. Who here was... Who's who's watching right now who is also here for the interview with Jim Kirkland? And gratitude. Thank you very much. To the Thank you, Hogan. I'm excited for that live stream. Hopefully you'll get the generator by then. There you go, Hogan. I also do need to get myself a generator to make that happen. And I think sometime in late March we'll be running a fundraiser for that. Um, so that I can afford that. But it's uh, it's going to be cool. It's going to be real cool. And it's going to be multiple live streams. Like, I don't know how often I can stream. Got to talk to my crewmates and everything. But if I could stream every day from the field, I would. We'll have to see. Um, but I think that'll be a wonderful outreach opportunity to show people firsthand what it's like to dig up a dinosaur. You know? Kind of demystify the whole process for you. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And Jody Fish was there for the interview with Jim Kirkland. And Machi and Trek Nerd. Yeah. Yeah. So I interviewed uh, the state paleontologist of Utah. And, uh, and my, like, big crew chief during the summer, Jim Kirkland. And, uh, yeah, Jim doesn't like the heat. Jim's been... Dude, I think, uh... Is it this year or next year? It'll be 50 years that Jim Kirkland has been out digging dinosaurs on the Colorado Plateau. So he is, uh, he knows more about dinosaurs of the Colorado Plateau than probably anybody else alive. Um, but yeah, Jim just kept like, oh, it's that, it's that darn academic calendar. You know, I make him sound like John Wayne. That darn academic calendar. Uh, the reason that we have to dig in the middle of the summer when it's the hottest rather than in the spring, or better yet, the fall, like October, is because, well, students have school in the spring and the fall. They're off, generally, in the summer. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, so we're there where it's just hellishly hot. And it's because we don't have a big budget to, like, hire a bunch of people. We have to accept student volunteers uh, to do most of the digging, and... Yeah, so we're out there when it's just, you know, blazingly hot. You look up into the sky and you expect to see three suns up there, you know? Like some sort of a Tatooine kind of a deal. But no, usually it's just the one. Usually. If it's... If, the, if you look up and see more than one sun, then you know it's, uh... It's time to go rest in the shade for a while. And, uh... Eat something salty and drink a bunch of water. Holy cow. <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm. Anyway. And yeah, it was a long interview, Jody Fish. Four hours, yeah. Holy cow. Um, but yeah, yeah. And Ziggy Nightmare, how are you doing, Ziggy? Welcome, welcome. Ziggy says, I hope you have a big brimmed hat to keep the sun off. I've got something better than that. Let me show you. Okay, well, I guess I also have that, too. Not just something better, but I have... I'll show you my, my two pieces of headwear for the field. Uh, the first is my digger hat. Uh, so named after... Uh, kind of a nickname for Australian soldiers. They called themselves diggers. I'm not sure why, but... Yeah. But this is made out of leather. And, uh, I've had this hat for probably... Oh, goodness. I've had this since I was 16, I think? I won't tell you how many years ago that was. But, uh, yeah. I got this for, like, $40. Maybe a little bit less than $50. It's like 48 or something. Uh, it's made of leather. R made right here in the USA. And uh, incredibly durable. It's thick enough that it won't fly off of my head if there's a gust of wind. 
which is something that you can't boast for a cowboy hat, usually. It's also far more durable than a cowboy hat. This thing has... I don't know. I've been whitewater rafting with it. It's been run over by trucks. It's... It's really taken a beating, and, uh... Yeah. Anyway. Love this hat. But the thing is, it is leather, and it's not breathable as a result. And so, if it's anything up to, like, maybe... 85, 90 degrees, then I'll typically wear this hat. Now, also, it's really nice that it has the brim turned up. So I can carry a generator on my shoulder, or a bag of plaster, or have a, a pick and a shovel slung over my shoulder like that. And it won't knock the hat off, because the brim is turned up. So it's not for fashion reasons, it's a very practical setup. Also, this is something that's, uh, well, my second piece of uh, field headgear is, uh, it's not a hat per se, I guess it kind of is. This is the best thing that you can wear when it's blindingly hot outside. When it's just hot as blazes, this is what you want. It's the same piece of headgear that's worn by U.S. Postal Service workers in hot climates or on very hot days. It was worn by explorers and various pillagers all over the world. Worn by the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army. You know, it's an incredibly practical piece of headgear that you'll probably recognize. This... Ladies and gents, is a sun helmet. And mine is a U.S. Marines military surplus one. I think this is like World War II vintage. So, put that on like that. It's got a wide brim to protect me from the sun. But the wonderful thing about it is the ventilation. So unlike a typical hat, which, you know, sits on your head and kind of cuts off the air on the top, Thank you, Darth Goof. Holy cow, 18 months. Thank you, thank you, Darth Goof, for the 18 months of support. That is stellar, and I appreciate it tremendously. So thank you, thank you. Thank you, Darth Goof, for helping me do what I do here. You know, through your continued support. Couldn't do it without continued supporters like you, so... Thank you very much for that. Anyway, so this has got a band, but there's actually a layer of air in between. And holy cow, Nell, thank you for the two gift subs. That is extraordinary. I really appreciate that, Nell. Thank you, thank you, Nell. There's now two people who will not have to watch ads for the next 30 days, and they'll get the emotes there. So, uh, hats off to you, Nell, or rather, sun helmets off, I suppose. But yeah, anyway, uh, this is what uh, U.S. soldiers and Marines would wear in World War II, and subsequently also, uh, when they weren't in combat. So, like, they're building an airfield, or they're, uh, I don't know, doing infrastructure stuff, offloading supplies, and it's really hot in the South Pacific. This is what they would be wearing. Um, so yeah. This is what I wear in the field. And I've had this since 2012. So... It'll be 11 years this year. 11 years. Um, and I only wear this when it's really hot out. Uh, it's not quite as durable as a leather hat. It's not as squishable or anything, but... Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And Vigilantis says, classic fieldwork hat. Literally all my lecturers who worked in Polynesia had these. It's the best thing you can get, Vigilante. It really is. Proper sun helmet? Unbeatable. Yeah. Uh. And Dinosaur Dave, yeah. That's what I was talking about. A digger hat. Yeah, there's even a poem about it. Um, or a poem or a song? I don't, I don't know where that term comes from, though. Digger. Uh, Roses and Tisa's diggers are Australian and New Zealander, and they're, yeah, Slatch Hat is felt, not leather, yeah, so this is, it's modeled on an Australian slouch hat, and they call it a slouch hat, because you're supposed to wear it like this, actually, kind of slouched like that, but, you know, I wear mine like this because, yeah, 
So it, it's kind of a, a modern descendant, I guess, of the uh, the archetypical classic Australian slouch hat. Um, but yeah, yeah. Definitely all get the same memo. There you go, Vigilante, yeah. A wide brim field work hat. Good stuff, yeah. So I have colleagues who swear by straw cowboy hats and stuff like that. Like laminated straw. Like uh, Denver Fowler, my old crew chief. Uh, well, shoot, we could probably find that. Um, Maybe I'll show you. I, I, let me find a picture of him in the field with his... Uh, he had a Justin brand uh, white straw cowboy hat, laminated. And, uh, yeah, he would get a new one of those every couple years, because they wear out, and they get crunched, and they're they're honestly a little bit delicate. Um, fieldwork photos, here we go, let's try 2012. Let's see. This is a very artsy black and white shot right there. Oh, come on. There we go. Yeah, there's Denver digging at a... This looks like a Triceratops brow horn right here. Kind of the base of a Triceratops brow horn plunging into the cliff. Or plunging into the ground, into the matrix there. Um, but yeah, there's his cowboy hat. I'll find you a better one. I probably have a shot of both, like, his hat on the, uh, the truck dashboard or something. Um, oh, here we go. Here's Denver and... John, Denver Fowler, and John Scanella, uh, examining what kind of a skull is that? <laughs> Not a dinosaur. Not a dinosaur there. But yeah, this is Denver's typical field attire, you know? Walmart jeans, uh, Walmart shirt. He would get these shirts and they'd just get like slowly turned brownish orange over the course of a summer. Because, you know, it's dealing with all this all this Hell Creek dust. Um, kind of turns things like a rusty kind of orange color. And John just always wears all black, so he wears all black in the field, too. I've never understood that. I would I would die. Um, especially with long pants. But uh, my typical field attire is as follows. Let me find a picture of me. I think we took some good photos here. Yeah, I, I think I used this for a profile picture all over the place. Yeah, I didn't get my legs, but anyway. Military surplus shirt, sun helmet, uh, two belts. I keep my rock hammer and my knife on a separate belt. Um, it's just kind of easier to take on and off that way. And, uh, yeah, and shorts, and then boots. Um, I used to use snake gaiters. Um, well, actually, they weren't really true snake gaiters, but they were, like, gaiters that would fit over the tops of the boots, like spats, almost, to keep, like, rocks and dirt and stuff like that from going into the tops of the boots. Now I wear boots that are tall enough that I don't really have to worry about that. So, yeah, back then I couldn't afford uh, taller boots, but now I've got them, and... Man, that, uh, it's excellent to have. Yeah. And that was a horse skull. Yes, indeed, Nell and Kirsten. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And, uh... Have a moment where it was kind of heartbreaking? I'm no. Destroying. Never. No, what blew his cheek. Dino's fiber. Thank you, Neil56. For the three months of support, really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Neil. And glue is cheap. For most people, thank you for helping me afford glue. Neil, I really appreciate your ongoing support. That means a lot to me. It really does. Yeah. And Scout says, two belts, Danny. The fastest dino idea in the West. Denver used to call me, uh, uh, Danny Five Belts. <laughs> Oh, look, it's Danny Five Belts. Oh. Because <laughs> I would have the belt on my shorts. I would have my, uh, you know, the belt that I have my rock hammer and my knife on. And then I had a waist belt on my rucksack that would come around. You'd 
Snap it like that. Another one up here. Um, I, that was that's four. But anyway, I think he added a fifth one just for dramatic effect and because it sounded better that way. Oh, Danny Five Belts. Thank you very much for the one hundred bits. Oh, Hogan. I made you an umbrella extra that's designed like the parachute the Curiosity rover landed on Mars with. That's really cool, Hogan. Holy cow. Um walking fast, space is cash and I'm homebound. <laughs> Mr. Coins, thank you for the four months of support. Really, really appreciate that. Holy cow. That's excellent. Thank you, Mr. Coins. And welcome back to Paleontologizer. Yeah. Um. Well, Hogan, that's very thoughtful of you. I... I don't know. I've an umbrella in the field. That could be really useful, actually, for, like... If I could open it up to shield gear and stuff like that to help keep it from getting UV damage while it sits out in the sun all day. I like that idea. Is it collapsible, this umbrella? It's a cool idea, Hogan. Um, by the way, Hogan, thank you for the 100 bits. Appreciate that very much. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh. Reach for a Red Bull. <laughs> oh no, Pimp Cat. I can't, I can't have energy drinks like that. They'll, yeah, I'll be bouncing off the walls, you know? Yeah. Um. But yeah. And Ashara Del says, do all of you wear the same colors so you don't get noticed on the sand? Ashara Del? No. In fact, Denver used to make fun of me for that too. You know? Um. Yeah, here. I think if we go to his website, uh, the Badlands Dinosaur Museum... Uh, website. Oh, that's... Let's bring that back to 100%, shall we? Um, fieldwork. There's a bunch of photos of me on their fieldwork page. Here's me in Denver, working in the field. We're digging up a triceratops here that I found. The site's called Count Tricula. Because we found so many triceratops over the years that I kind of ran out of names. I named this one because I found it. Count Tricula. So here's Denver. Here's me. So I I don't know. A lot of my stuff is like earth tones. It's a lot of military surplus. And Denver would always say like, Danny, <laughs> if you die out there on the prairie, <laughs> they'll never find your body. <laughs> uh, it's like, oh, where's Daddy's corpse gone? I uh, can't be bothered. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, so yeah, and uh oh, my 3D printer is making noises. What's what's going on? Sometimes a little bit of filament kind of sticks around the edge of the nozzle and then it adheres to the print and then it hits the print nozzle as it swings back and forth. Anyway. We're all good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, and real men grow beards? That was definitely the case. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Denver and I worked together for, shoot, like, I think, like, seven years? Um, yeah, yeah. It'd be nice to be able to go out and do fieldwork with Denver again sometime, but he's, he's really grown that program to a significant extent. It's pretty impressive. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Here, um...
Badlands Dinosaur Museum. I know I've shown this before, but, uh... There we go. Uh, here's a little video that they've got up on YouTube about the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. This is a really, really cool museum because it was built during the, like, Jurassic Park craze of the 1990s. Um, and uh, there was, like, an old married couple who opened it, and they had a bunch of, like, privately owned fossils and stuff. And uh, anyway, it eventually failed, and it just sat vacant for a long time. Um, or not sat vacant, but just it was mothballed, I guess, for a long time. And then uh, around 2015, the city of Dickinson, North Dakota, where this is located, um, they decided to purchase it and turn it into a municipal museum. So it's city-owned and city-operated. And they were looking for a dinosaur paleontologist to become the curator. And Denver was just finishing his PhD under Jack Horner at the time. And uh, anybody who knows anything about dinosaur paleontology knows that jobs as a dinosaur paleontologist jobs are incredibly scarce you take what you can get and sometimes you move across the country or across the world to get a job there there's maybe a handful of jobs that open up every year and uh yeah so this is pretty competitive and there are people who flew in from overseas to interview for this job in little dickinson north dakota in the middle of nowhere honestly but uh denver decided to apply for it he didn't have a car at the time, so I actually, uh, he asked me if I could drive him there, because I had a car. I said, yeah, that sounds like fun. It's going to be a road trip. So we, we road tripped from, uh, from Bozeman, Montana, out to Dickinson, North Dakota. Denver interviewed for the job, aced the interview. Did well enough that they wanted him to come back, like, weeks or a month later for uh, a second round of interviews. He got that one, too. I drove him again. It was great. Um, yeah. Denver was nervous about it, but he didn't need to be. He was the best candidate for the job, and they gave it to him. And he's been running this museum ever since. And, uh, yeah. Uh, let me turn the sound on, actually. Here we go. Yeah. Hi, my name is Dr. Denver Fowler, and I'm the curator of paleontology here at Badlands Dinosaur Museum, Dickinson Museum Center. So what yeah. I know about the Badlands Dinosaur Museum is the opportunity that we have to do something different. Um, we're planning our new exhibits. You know. <laughs> there's, there's the hadrosaur arm that Liz and I had to, had to crack off of the host block. This is like a mummified hadrosaur arm. Probably from Brachylophosaurus or maybe Gryposaurus. I don't know. I'd love to hear what Liz would have to say about it. Liz works on hadrosaurs. Liz is married to Denver, by the way. They're kind of a paleontology power couple. Um, but yeah, yeah, man. We In the welcome video, there's some footage of me like down in a hole using a hammer and chisel. That's trying to get this thing, crack it off of the main block. Because it didn't seem to actually extend anywhere. It's just a, an arm. There was just a severed hadrosaur arm mummified there in a, a block of hard sandstone. And so we had to break off a chunk of the sandstone small enough and light enough that we could move it. And luckily, it was just the arm, so. But yeah, yeah. And uh, Nell says Denver is much more soft-spoken than I thought he'd be, because he's on camera. <laughs> uh, a lot of people kind of clam up when they get on camera. Um, and I don't, I wouldn't say Denver clams up, but he's bit more prim and proper, you know? He's a professional. You know, he's not like some loud mouth, you know, Twitch science streamer. <laughs> he's a PhD researcher, you know? Oh, yeah. And Ashara Dell, that too. That too. Denver, you know, was very colorful language. In the best possible way. The opportunity that we have to do something different. We're planning our new exhibits in a way that's different from what you've seen before at other museums. We want to do immersive exhibits. We want to have unique specimens that you can't see anywhere else. And tell stories about um, basically being a dinosaur detective. How do we find out um, how these animals lived? What's the process of science? Yep. Not just walking. Oh, that was uh, that was Count Tricula. That's the Triceratops that I found. Out, um, how these animals lived. What's the yeah, there it is right there. I think they have this up on display now. Yeah, in fact, let's let's search for that. Um, 
Let's see. Count Tricula. Triceratops. Oh, this is from Denver's blog from ages ago. Yeah. Uh, Count Tricula. Oh, and I did that drawing. Yeah. Kind of an intermediate species Triceratops between Horridus and Prorsus. Like Yoshi's Trike. Um, yeah. Want to start a season at Count Tricula? Decent looking Triceratops skull discovered by crew member Danny Anduza last year. And last year, in this case, was... Yeah, that was 2015, because this was written in 2016. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna start with Count Tricula. There's me right there. Right here. And then I just drew this really crudely, like an outline of what the skull would look like. Um, because that's the midline of the frill right there. This is the back. And there's the front. Unfortunately, the face had all been weathered away probably a hundred years before this. But, uh, yeah. It's been a half day clearing overburden and then dug, ar dug in around the skull. And who's that dingus? There's me right there. There's, uh, Holly Flora and Jack Wilson. And Denver is standing behind Jack right there. Um, I don't know who took this photo. Maybe Warwick took it. For 2016? I'm not sure. 2015. Yeah. But, uh, anyway. Yeah. So once we actually find something, we figure out where the bone layer is, and then we take away all of the crud on top of what we call overburden. So that's what we were doing here. So, yeah. Yeah. That's just a floating shovel. Very funny, real men grow beards. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. And there's me again, and Denver, and Holly. Um, and there she is. Holy cow. Triceratops in there. It's weird that, like, it was just on the surface at the top of this hill. So there's, like, soil on top. Normally, there's all kinds of mudstone on top of a site like this, but here it was pretty low down. And there were roots that were kind of shooting through all of this, so it made excavation a bit more difficult. We actually needed scissors at this site for cutting through roots. Roots of, you know, the prairie grass and the sagebrush and stuff that was there. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, yep, there's our little shade tarp at the top of the site there. Yeah, there's Jack Wilson right here. But, yeah, having shade at a site can be incredibly, incredibly important. Like, it can be a... Maybe I'm exaggerating, but it feels like maybe a 30-degree temperature difference in direct sunlight versus under a shade tarp, you know? So, yeah, yeah. Very shady. Very sketch. There you go, Smorphosaurus. Yeah. Yeah. And Vigilantis is nothing worse than roots in your trench. Yeah, it's... It could be lousy. But we got lucky. It was a decent specimen, you know? Here's me again. Um, and there's a feed scoop. So that's our process. Is we, like, clear away rock. We put it into the scoop. And that way, if we realize that we've accidentally taken a bit of bone, because it can be very difficult sometimes to tell what's rock and what's bone. It's nice to have kind of a, a reservoir in between like that. So we wait until the feed scoop is full, we make sure there's no bone in that, and then we chuck it. Um, and yeah, here's some bits of bone that are here in the aluminum foil, and then there's glue inside of this mustard bottle here. We call that glue Vinac. It's polyvinyl acetate. Uh, yeah, PVA glue. Yeah. And, yep. In here, Denver has drawn on the extent of the skull. There's where the horns would be, right here and right here, if they were still there. They hadn't weathered away years ago. And then there's the extent of that frill. He's a big boy. Yeah. Uh, Count Tricula. Yep. And you can actually see, yep, there is the margin of the squamosal right there. You can pick out right there. Yeah, very nice. Uh, so anyway, not the prettiest dinosaur in the world, but it turned out to be an important one. Um, yeah. Very nice. Very nice. And why was it named Count Tricula? Because I'd kind of run out of other good names. I found a lot of Triceratops over the years. 
And, uh... I don't know. We would give... We would give sites names because it's easier to remember than saying, like, oh, yeah, site V770392. Uh, it's like, nobody's going to remember that, but Count Dracula, people remember. Kind of put a face to a name like that. Uh, so, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and Noel Edge Expert. Very funny, Andy. Welcome back. Yeah. And what was my favorite named dinosaur? What do you mean? Like, favorite dinosaur that's been scientifically described? Shoot, I don't know. You could type in exclamation mark fave dino. Oh, do you mean a site maybe now? Oh, shoot. So, um... Yeah, and it's F-A-V dino. Oh, we should make an alias for that, shouldn't we? Uh... F-A-V dino. There you go. Um... Uh, and actually, Denver would sometimes spell it differently than I would. I wonder if there's more... If you put an E in there. Count Tricula. Yeah, there we go. There's a bunch more stuff. Apparently, it's on display at the museum. I've not been there in years. But, uh... Oh, Facebook. You're ridiculous. But yeah. Uh, this is, oh, beautiful. They've got a lovely occipital condyle right there. That's gorgeous. So this is the back of the frill. And since the back of the frill was the one facing the ground, it's going to be better preserved. It's less eroded. It's less chunked up. So, yeah, you can go see one of the dinosaurs that I dug up at the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in Dickinson, North Dakota. Seriously, if you're ever driving through North Dakota and you're on Highway 94, I think... Make sure you visit the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. It is the the premier attraction in Dickinson, North Dakota. It's right next to the highway. You can grab a bite to eat. You can go into the museum. You can see some cool dinosaurs. They've got some really, really unique specimens there. It's cool stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Danny named Tricula. Favorite one of the dinos. Oh, my favorite site names. Well, shoot, my favorite site name is one that I didn't actually come up with. That would be Danny Ceratops. I couldn't come up with a name fast enough for Denver to, to write it down, and he was logging the site. So he's like, oh, I'll just call it Danny Ceratops. But that's one that hopefully one day, one of these days, is going to be named as a new species of uh, Ceratopsian dinosaur. So yeah, that would be my favorite. It would be Danny Ceratops. Yeah. But I've got we got a lot of fun site names. Lots of, like, references to different songs and stuff. We have a lot of sites that are named after, like, Flight of the Concord songs. So, yeah. Yeah. The belt joke. No, n never that saggy iguana. <laughs> um, <laughs> I remember one of my favorite site name stories. I hope this is okay that I'm relaying this. But, uh, shoot. Here's, uh, where was that photo of, of Denver and John? Um, oh, this is different, but here's, no, shoot. That didn't work. I'm trying to open things up into Chrome so that you can see. <laughs> here's Denver and he made a little hand puppet. Um, I think he found some little glass eyes that somebody had left during a previous field season. Uh, we would sometimes keep googly eyes in our bags. Denver would do this sometimes. And, uh, if we would, we'd find, like, an animal skull, like, there's a coyote skull, or there's an opossum skull, or... Actually, I don't think they had possums this far north. But, um, you know, raccoon skull, a porcupine skull or something. And sometimes he'd... <laughs> He'd take little googly eyes out of his pack and he'd put them into the skull. Just leave it there for somebody else to find and go, what the heck? And so I think Denver found some at some point and he also had a little cowboy hat in there. And anyway, he's just being goofy. Um, but yeah, yeah. And Vigilante says, I love googly eyes and I also keep them in my bag. That's, that's like a field work essential, you know? You gotta have that. Yeah. Here's the photo I was trying to find with Denver and John. So Denver Fowler. 
who is now curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in Dickinson, North Dakota. And John Scanella, who is now the curator of Museum of the Rockies. Uh, I was working with both of them in 2012, and it was just it was just four of us on the crew that year. Uh, us three, and then a volunteer from Pennsylvania, uh, Lou. Cool guy. So anyways, just us four. Really small crew. You can see Lou's shadow right there. Um, but here they are looking at a horse skull. Maybe this is where Denver found those eyes, actually. Um, but anyway. Uh, one time, he and John were working in the Hell Creek together. And uh, John Scanella studies Triceratops. They've worked on a few Triceratops projects together. But John is all about Triceratops. That's his career. John is all about Triceratops. Uh, and so Denver was trying to find Triceratops specimens for John's thesis. And he found a really nice Triceratops horn at one point. And, uh, and so he collected it, and then he, he named the site, that site where he found the horn. You know, it had a, a site number, but then you give it a name, too. And so he named it Got the Horn for John. And he thought that was so funny. And so he walked back to camp. He's got this Triceratops horn, and then written on the side of the jacket says, Got the horn for John. And Denver's like, <laughs> Nope. It's, everybody else in the crew is, you know, from the U.S. Nobody has no idea that that's a joke. Like, yeah, he, he got the horn for John. It's a Triceratops horn that he got for John. He got the horn for John. <laughs> Apparently in the U.K., that means that, like, you've got the hots for somebody. <laughs> And he, it's an innuendo. There you go, Shardell. Yes. And so, yeah, that's uh, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. <laughs> Denver was so disappointed because nobody else understood it. Um, because you know it's it's British slang. So yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, and Vigilantis says correct. As a Brit, I can confirm. There you go, Vigilantis. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh. He never felt so homesick until that moment. There you go, Saggy Iguana, yeah. Although Denver is is very thoroughly, you know, he's been very much Americanized at this point. And you can probably hear that in his voice, too. Um, here, let's finish this video like we were going to do. Yeah. You want to do immersive exhibits. You want to have unique specimens. I'll go back a little bit. So what I love about him is Dr. There we go. Let's start from the beginning. We're only a few minutes in. Hi, my name is Dr. Denver Fowler, and I'm the curator of paleontology here at Badlands. And Denver's very much not a colonialist, Godzilla enthusiast, definitely not. No, his, yeah, uh, he would be, oh man, those, those, them's fighting words to him. Yeah. Dinosaur Museum, Dickinson Museum Center. So what I love about the Badlands Dinosaur Museum is the opportunity that we have to do something different. Um, we're planning our new exhibits. And there's our hadrosaur hand. Seen before at other museums. Yeah. We want to do immersive exhibits. We want to have unique specimens that you can't see anywhere else and tell stories about um, basically being a dinosaur detective. How do we find out um, how these animals lived? What's the process of science? We're not just walking. It's Marvin! Your cousin, Marvin Barry! You know JMM, thank you for the raid. Welcome. Good to have you here, JMM. Thank you for the raid. What's shaking? Welcome back to Paleontologizing. I, uh, I'm glad you could be here. Yeah. Uh, let's continue. Tell stories about, um, basically being a dinosaur detective. How do we find out, um, how these animals lived? What's the process of science? We're not just walking through time, as you might have seen in other exhibits. We're doing something different here. That's what we want to do. My name yeah. is Destiny Wolf, and I am a board member. Yeah, I've never actually met Destiny. Um, in the interest of time, we might skip through this part. Here's Liz talking about... So Liz is married to Denver. My name is Dr. Liz Friedman Fowler. And yeah. I'm on board of the Stark County Historical Society and the Southwest North Dakota Museum Foundation. And I'm a paleontologist, so here at the museum... Get that straight, you know? The Southwest North Dakota East Museum Association Northern Region. What was it? My name is Dr. Liz Friedman Fowler, and I'm on the board of the Stark County Historical Society and the Southwest North Dakota Museum Foundation. The Southwest North Dakota Museum Association. Museum Foundation. Southwest North Dakota. 
Adam. Anyway, Liz is, she works on hadrosaurs. She is, uh, she is the consummate scientist. Liz is very, very good at what she does. And holy cow, she's less boisterous than Denver is. Uh, but... Man, Liz is an excellent paleontologist. Paleontologist. So here at the museum, I work with our curator, Dr. Denver Fowler, to uh, uncover new dinosaurs and improve the exhibits and just bring a lot of fresh paleontology and science to Dickinson. Yeah. Some of our past fun. <laughs> there she is wearing Denver's hat. <laughs> Denver's like twice as tall as Liz is. So <laughs> it just looks kind of funny. Grazing yeah. Enabled us to go out to Montana in the summer and dig some incredible specimens we've got an articulated Ooh. arm of a mummified hadrosaur i helped dig that up yeah and we're also digging up a complete articulated tyrannosaur it's one of the most beautiful fossils i've ever seen yep we're seeking funding to help us expand our field work program so that we can dig up new dinosaurs and the longer we're able to stay out and dig each summer the more amazing fossils we can bring back here to dickinson and then during the rest of the year, we work on improving the exhibits here. So we're updating exhibits like the ones behind me from some of the older scientific ideas to the most current research. Very cool stuff. It's It really is a gem. This museum is uh, is incredible. And look, they have one of those. Does anybody know what this is? Let's get this out of the way. This, they have, a I guess, a, like an Xbox Connect hooked up to a projector and it is a topographic map that's interactive so it's a sandbox and you like you make a big pile of the sand like that and it draws topo lines on it in real time and uh and like it changes as you move the sand around it's really really cool um i've never seen this at another place before but this is one of the first things that denver brought to the museum and kids and their parents everybody loves it it's really really neat I've never seen this anywhere else, but uh, it's really awesome. And then you, you go like this with your hands over it, and then the, the sensor picks up that you're doing this with your fingers, and it, it makes it rain onto the... So, like, it turns blue down here, and the water actually runs into the areas of lowest relief. Uh, so you can make little lakes like that, and then if you take your hand and you, you carve away part of the mountain, you can watch the water, the water projected onto it, like, slosh down into the next lowest point. It's really, really cool. So, uh, neat stuff. Yeah. Hi, my name's Bob Furman. I'm the There's Bob. At the Dickinson Museum Center, and I'd like to welcome you here. You know, every time we turn... Yeah, so Bob's like the director. He does a bunch of financial stuff. Um, and back to Denver. Yeah. That. I help save that. It's my history. Hmm. If we can uh, increase the amount of funds we have available, we can start to build some of these really exciting new exhibits. Um, in the past, we've, we've had some uh, contributions to our fieldwork program, which is really where everything starts. Um, and because of that, we've been able to find some fantastic new sites. Please consider donating to help us with our fieldwork, exhibits, and educational outreach to improve both tourism here in Dickinson, as well as education for everyone in the local area. I encourage you to give generously to the yeah. Dickinson Museum. Cool stuff. Lininess is that dromaeosaur behind Denver. I mean, holy cow. Uh, yeah. So this is something that Denver was really, really proud of. So Denver had two world-class dinosaur models. Uh, he, he commissioned them from an artist in Eastern Europe. In, oh, where was he? I want to say Croatia, but I don't think that's right. Boban Filipovic is his name. Uh, let's see, Dromaeosaur, here we go, oh, a Cararaptor, there we go, not Dakota Raptor, because Denver was, you know, uh, suspicious of that from the start, but here's a close-up of the head right there. And uh, it's pouncing on a little mammal. And I wonder if... Let's see. Can we find a better picture of that? Um, we'll search a Cararaptor. Because it really is beautiful. I mean, holy cow. 
one of the best feathered dinosaur models in the entire world. Right there in Dickinson, North Dakota. There it is, pouncing on this mammal. Just exquisite. And look at that sickle toe claw right there. Oh boy. Yeah, very, very cool. And there's uh, there's Bobon working on it right there. That's Facebook, so we might not be able to see it. Uh, oh, but they won an international award there. Yeah. Uh, from SVP, a highlight was finding out that one of our new feather dinosaur models has won the Lazendorf National Geographic Paleo Art Sculpture Prize for 2018. This prestigious international award is given to a single sculpture per year, representing the finest and most scientifically accurate sculpture of an extinct vertebrate, animal with bones. Uh, the model that won was... Ho, 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 ho. Oh, man. Trier Arconcus. Looks like a half plucked turkey and walks like a pot bellied bear. Thank you, Tea Time Cat, for the 17 months of support. That was some funny timing there. Tea Time Cat, um, thank you, thank you for your ongoing support. Seriously, that means a whole lot to me. It really does. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Who can tell me? Oop, open image and new tab. Who this critter is right here. Does anybody know? Hmm. Jody Fish, Captain Hook of the Prairie. Yes, indeed. Lenina, yep, you got it, Tarquin. Yes, yes, yes. This is the first ever dinosaur that I have my name on as uh, as an author. Yeah. Uh, Trirarconcus. Is an Alvarosaur dinosaur, the last of the Alvarosaurs. And I've actually decided, well, I'll tell you about this in a minute, but yeah. Uh, a Hell Creek Alvarosaurid. There you go. Very, very cool. Uh, so yeah, it won an award for that. So you can see this critter there in. Uh... There we go. You can see this critter, and you can see our true Arconcus there. In North Dakota. Um, stuff you can't see literally anywhere else in the world. It's unique to this museum. Uh, and man, RIP to that mammal. It's about to get wrecked. You might be the biggest mammal in the Hell Creek, but... Oh boy, still lunch for a hungry little dromaeosaur. Yeah. Hmm. Shardell says he has flowers growing out of his head. Oh, this guy? Those are turkey feathers, I think. Yeah. So these are real feathers on this animal. Uh, there's emu feathers back here, and I think most of these are turkey feathers here. But yeah, really, really cool. Um, these are pretty awesome animals, and you can see them at the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. Yeah. I help preserve that. I help save that. It's my history. If we can uh, increase the amount of funds we have available, we can start to build some of these really exciting new exhibits. Um, in the past, we've, we've had some uh, contributions to our fieldwork program, which is really where everything starts. Mm. Um, and because of that, we've been able to find some fantastic new sites. Please consider donating to help us with our fieldwork, exhibits, yeah. and educational outreach. So they can always both tourism here in Dickinson, as well as education for everyone in the local area. <laughs> I encourage you to give this generously is great. to the Dickinson Museum Center so that we can yeah. show you what we do and Good stuff. for generations to come. Very cool little museum. They've done some really amazing things. Many of you probably heard about Despletosaurus Horn, uh, excuse me, Despletosaurus Wilson Eye. Right here. Uh... There we go. Yeah. New Tyrannosaurus species from Montana. This is work done by the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. They're really moving up in the world, and it's wonderful to see. This is like I was telling Denver when uh, when he was first like interviewing for that job. I'm like, Denver, you're a shoe-in, and also, when you get the job, you are going to be in the same position that our boss, you know, your advisor, my boss Jack Horner was in when he first started at Museum of the Rockies. It's like, here's the small local museum 
that's just kind of a stone's throw away from uh, some really exciting fossil sites. You can generate enthusiasm. You can raise money. You could turn this museum into a powerhouse. And he's doing it, which is so cool. Hogan, holy cow, thank you for those five gift subs. Really, really appreciate that. Phenomenal. Holy cow. And there we go. A reprise. Uh. <laughs> Dorkalotl. Five gift subs. Hogan and Dorkalotl. Holy moly. Thank you, thank you for your contributions. That is phenomenal. I mean, that helps me do what I do here. You are helping to feed a starving scientist, and I, uh... I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. That's extraordinary. Um... Yeah, and Triceratops' Elton John's voice is a little bit off in that video clip, because it wasn't actually Elton John. I set that over an Elton John clip. But, yeah. Sharp ears there, Triceratops. And thank you, Nell! For gifting Trappy Jenkins. Wonderful. Trappy, enjoy. And thank you so much, Nell. I really appreciate that. Uh, by the way, Nell, I've been enjoying that chocolate that you sent. I'll probably have another piece right now, actually. All right. This was very generously sent by Give Them Nell uh, to give me chocolate. And... Let's see, what shall I have this time? Ooh. Let me have one of these. This is probably caramel or something, right? Not my favorite, so I'll eat it first and I'll enjoy it. Yeah. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. Hi. Thank you, Hogan. Yeah. If we get to a level five hype train. I'll play some ukulele songs about science. How's that sound? Yeah. Uh-oh. We have a lovely Tinamu bird announcing some gift subs. And it might be overloading. Might want to go take cover. Murph is overloading the system with ten gift subs. Holy cow, Murph! Thank you, thank you, and don't worry about that bird. She'll be fine. Bird, it may not seem like much. Five hundred bits goes a long way towards supporting science. I'll treat here on Twitch. Holy cow! Just outdoors. With sincere appreciation and gratitude, thank you very much for the one hundred bits. You too, Hugh. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. <laughs> we'll totally blame the dinosaurs. <laughs> there you go, Kolganek. <laughs> Holy moly. Murph. Ten. Give subs. I, I could do this twice, or I could do this once. Because a ten. It's two fives. As I learned back in preschool. I'm a scientist. Oh, um, thank you so much, Murph, for the 10 gift subs. I really, really appreciate that. Holy cow. That is tremendous. Look, we're at 29 out of 40 for our goal today. We're almost three quarters of the way there. So that is extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Holy moly, Murph. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Just Outdoors, for the 500 bits. That's like 100 bits, but five of them. It's a lot. So thank you, thank you. Thank you, Darkalotl, for the 100 bits there. Beautiful. And we're now 5% of the way to a level 5. Again, you've got three and a half minutes to try and get us to a level 5. And then I'll play some ukulele songs. So we'll, uh... We'll see about that. We'll see if we get there. Golganek, thank you for the 100 bits. Thank you for the hydrate, Miss Yvette. Cheers. Yeah. Hmm. And very funny, Hogan. You know, there's there's a volume button right there at the bottom 
on the Twitch interface. Um, you can mute it if you want. <laughs> you think my singing is that bad? <laughs> I know you're kidding, though. <clears throat> I appreciate you. And, uh, Thalo says, thank you to Murph. Thalo got a gift sub, thanks to Murph. Thalo, not only will you not have to watch ads for the next 30 days, you also get another perk. All these emotes that you can use to your heart's content for the next 30 days. And if you want them on a more permanent basis, you could subscribe. Just $5 a month, you know? Everybody gets to watch the broadcast for free, but if you want special perks like the emotes and ad-free, then uh, subscriptions are the way to do it. Like Dinosaur Dave has just gifted us 10 subs, and we've recently upgraded our, our Tinamu. I'm sure it's up to the task. Uh-oh, maybe, maybe not. Take cover. The Dinosaur Dave is overloading the system with 10 gift subs. Dinosaur Dave, holy moly, thank you, thank you. 500 bits goes a long way towards supporting science. Really appreciate that. And thank you for the 500 bits, Just Outdoors. I think... I think we got there. I think that's a level 5, isn't it? And we're at 39 out of 40. We're one away from our sub goal. Holy cow. That is, uh... That's pretty extraordinary. Thank you, thank you. And Murph did it! Murph! Holy moly. You, uh... <clears throat> you absolutely did it. Look. 40 out of 40 right there. Do you see that? Look, right down, right down here. Look at, look at that. Right here. 40, 41 out of 40. Vigilanta. Vigilanta. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that more than you know. We've exceeded our sub goal. That's extraordinary. Thank you for all of the support, everybody. That's, uh... Murph beat me to it. Well, you got us over the top, Vigilanta. Holy moly. That's, uh... Pretty extraordinary. It really is. Holy moly. Um... Take that, Capitalism. There you go, Vigilanta. Yes. <laughs> Community funding. No shareholders involved. <laughs> Mm. <clears throat> uh, UQ Uke says Miss Yvette. Yeah, I'll get it out. We'll, uh, we'll have some ukulele songs. There we go. There's the old uke. With my ichthyosaur on there. So I brought this uke with me from Montana. I, uh... Well, I'll tell you why I play ukulele. Ukulele, rather. And my... My grandpa... Uh... My dad's dad. Grandpa Anduza. Uh, he was born on the island of Maui. And thank you, Galara Dragon. Galara Dragon. <laughs> I'm glad you're in, Galara Dragon. Thank you, thank you for, uh, for your contribution there. I really appreciate it. We got two minutes left. My grandpa and Duza. Grandpa, if you're watching. Love you, Grandpa. Aloha. I hope you're uh, hope you're having a good day. My grandpa was born on in Hawaii, on the island of Maui. And uh, so he and all of his siblings uh, all, you know, learned to play ukulele. And uh, many of my... Well, my dad and many of his siblings... I think my dad and all of his siblings, all four... All four Uh, all three of his siblings. They all play ukulele as well. But nobody in my generation uh, that I know of played ukulele. And I wanted to help, you know, carry this tradition forward, I guess. 
Thank you, Smorphosaurus, for the 134 bits. Really appreciate that, Smorph. Thank, thank you, thank you. And, uh, you know, as luck would have it, ukulele is also, like, an ideal fieldwork instrument. This is an excellent, excellent instrument to bring out into the field when you're digging up dinosaurs. Because, for one thing, it's small, you know? I'm not wheeling a grand piano or a tuba or uh, a sousaphone out into the field. You know, I don't have a big ungainly harp that I'm trying to carry out there in my field vehicle. You know, just a little ukulele. It's also great for, you know, singing around a campfire, which, you know, say what you like about a tuba. Lovely instrument, but it's difficult to sing when you're playing it. Can't really, I don't know. It's not a great, like, solo instrument, unfortunately. Uh, and also, not only does an ukulele sound wonderful, and it can be an excellent solo instrument, but an ukulele is also a, you know, you could say that it's a, um, it's a distinctly fun and, say, unpretentious kind of instrument. When you uh, open up a case and you pull out an ukulele, there's it's a very different vibe than if you pull out, say, a violin or something like that, you know? You pull out a, pull out a violin and people's eyebrows raise and they go, oh, well, hmm, this is, you know, their expectations are way up here. I say, this is going to be, uh, you know, we expect a virtuoso here. An ukulele, especially a, an orange ukulele with an ichthyosaur on the side and an ichthyosaur right here, too. Um, yes, that is an ichthyosaur, not a dolphin. Note the the vertical tail fluke right there. Ichthyosaur. <laughs> you plot an ukulele and nobody really expects all that much. It's easy to impress with an ukulele. Stakes are low. You can have fun with it. So, uh, yeah. Uh, ukulele. That's my instrument of choice. Now, I used to play these a few of these songs for my students all the time, and... Uh, I hope you like them too. We'll start off with the Dinosaur March. This is a song that I learned from the music teacher at the school that I used to teach at, but I made some modifications. We'll see if you can spot those modifications. All right, ears open. Let's do the Dinosaur March. And, uh, and shoot, real quick, let's change our category here. We'll get rid of these tabs. There we go. Here we are. Edit stream info. And moderators, it'd be great if I could figure out a way for you to be able to do this. But um, I don't know if that's possible. If moderators, because you just use a command to change the category. But we're in music now. So let's do it. Uh, this song's called The Dinosaur March. And... Uh, if you're not inclined to music, just stick around. We'll, we'll be back to science in just a few minutes here. But I think you'll like these anyway. This one's called The Dinosaur March. See if you can pick up the parts that, uh, that I modified to make it more paleontologically authentic. It goes like this. Many, many years ago before the people came, the animals upon the earth, they did not look the same. They lived for 170 million years, but now they are no more. Except for birds, because as we now recognize as paleontologists, and if you ask evolutionary biologists or ornithologists as well, they'll tell you the very same thing that, strictly speaking, dinosaurs never really went extinct because, you know, birds themselves are living dinosaurs, having evolved from bipedal, feathered, meat-eating dinosaurs. They were the dinosaurs. Allosaurus diplodocus, Stegosaurus allosaurus, Ankylosaurus and Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus rex. So that's the first verse on the chorus. There wasn't a second verse when I learned this, so I had to add one myself, and it goes like this. about these awesome beasts by studying their bones. Skeletons under the ground that partly turned to stone. We 
dig them up and we clean them and we raise them off the floor to build a dinosaur. A Patasaurus diplodocus, Stegosaurus allosaurus, Ankylosaurus and Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus Rex. There you go, the dinosaur march. Yeah. And uh, and there you go, Vigilanta. Yeah. There are a lot of verses to that. I know like three of them. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, let's do I'm a Paleontologist next. And uh, yeah, that's a song by the band They Might Be Giants. And uh, this might be one of my favorite ukulele songs. It goes like this. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush. Because the treasures that I seek, they're rare and ancient things. Like Velociraptor's jaws, Rachiopteryx's wings. And all the kids want to see them. You know, or the viewers here on Paleontology, I think, who want to see them. Lining up, up at our museum. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. Could it be an herbivore? Crushing plants with rounded teeth Or a ferocious carnivore Who moves so quickly on its feet Needs like pieces of a puzzle That I'd love to try and solve So much fun to think about How a species has evolved And all the kids Who wanna see them They're lining up At our museum I am a paleontologist that's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. There you go. Yeah. I might need to retune this real quick, and then we'll do the Galaxy Song. I know that's several people's favorite song that we do here. She's a little sharp. C is a little sharp. Hmm. It's colder in here than it usually is. It's uh, contracting the body of the uke, making everything a little bit sharper. There we go. That's better. Yeah. You don't think you know the Galaxy song? Well, Ashara Dell, you're in for a treat. A treat indeed. This one's not explicitly about paleontology, but it's about science and the it's about the perspective that we gain when we we think about the world around us and indeed the universe around us in a scientific way, through a scientific lens. And how that Yeah. That can kind of change our perspective. This song goes out to anybody who might be, uh, maybe they're not having the, the best day right now. Maybe they need a little bit of a change of perspective. And to them I will sing, Just remember that you're standing on a planet that's evolving, revolving at 900 miles an hour. It's opening at 90 miles a second, so it's reckoned a sun that is the source of all our power. Now the sun and you and me and all the stars that we can see, they're moving at a million miles a day. In an outer spiral of 13,000 light years wide of the galaxy we call the Milky Way. The galaxy itself contains 200 billion stars. It's 100,000 light years side the sun. It bulges in the middle, 13,000 light years thick, but out by us is just 3,000 light years wide. Now we're 30,000 light years from galactic central point. We go round every 200 million years. 
And our galaxy is only one of millions of billions in our amazing and expanding universe. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The universe itself contains. The universe itself keeps on expanding and expanding. There we go. Uh, the universe itself keeps on expanding and expanding in all of the directions it can whiz. As fast as it can go, the speed of light you know. 12 million miles a minute, and that's the fastest speed there is. So remember when you're feeling very small and insecure, how amazingly unlikely is your birth. And pray that there's intelligent life somewhere up in space Cause it's hard to find down here on Earth That's the Galaxy Song Thank you, thank you everybody For all of your incredible support Today 41 gift subs Thank you for helping me do what I do here It's such a uh, an honor and a privilege to be able to, to Talk with all of you about science just kind of celebrate the wonder of it all with all of you. I feel like the luckiest guy in the world. Thank you for making that happen through your, your contributions there. I really, really appreciate that. Yeah. Put this away, and before I forget, let me change the uh, streaming category too. We shall go back to, uh, to science here. I don't think we've had any dinosaur deep dives yet today. Do I need to lower the price on the dinosaur deep dives? Hmm. I think I just might have to. Yeah. John Me says, I missed listening to your ukulele songs. Well, thank you, John Me. I hope you enjoyed. Yeah. And I had none lined up. No, none at all. I don't think, Jody Fish. Let me scroll through. Yeah, no. Maybe there's some from a few days ago or something? I want to say that... I want to say Claire Burr redeemed one. Which we never had a chance to go over. I think Claire Burr had redeemed Fuquisaurus, an Iguanodontian from Japan. Possibly the best-known Japanese dinosaur. Um, so let's do that. Because I neglected to do that right when we... Uh... I think it was... What was that? I think that might have been Friday when we were all focused on Deinonychus. We had Deinonychus tunnel vision. But let's talk a little bit about Fuquisaurus. First off, I'll see if I can find that image for you. Um, but I... Uh, I'm going to say I showed you this earlier. This would have been... March of 2020 or earlier... February, March. Uh, there's Fuqui Raptor, or Fuqui Venator, rather. There's Fuqui Venator, Fuqui Raptor, Fuqui Saurus, Fuqui Titan. And these are from Fuqui Prefecture in Japan. Back when I was teaching full time, I used to draw on the, the whiteboard for the kids every morning what day of the week it was. Because we we're learning our letters, learning to read and write. And uh, the parents would drop the kids off and. I didn't want the parents to walk in and go with, try and pronounce the dinosaur name and inadvertently, you know, say a cuss word. Um, because Fukui is spelled F-U-K-U-I. That's Fukui Prefecture in northern Japan. I think it might, might be up in Hokkaido uh, on the northern island. But uh, yeah, Fukui Venator. So I had to obscure the name. Um, and I had to do that for all of the... We don't have very many dinosaurs that start with F, and so, uh, yeah, there were a lot, practically all of them, you know, yeah, here's Fuqui Raptor. Um, <laughs> which is some sort of allosauroid, I think. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and your Deinonychus Tunnel Mission. I saw that, Lenina. That was brilliant. Thank you again for making that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. And Fukui Prefecture is in central Japan. I guess I was wrong. Okay, Diagonal, thank you. Central Japan. So it's on the island of Honshu? Huh. Um, and Zuni Ceratops. There you go, Claire Bird. Thank you, thank you. We'll do Zuni Ceratops as well. Two excellent dinosaurs. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And... Some Moonrise Rabbit, Flute Lyrebird. We'll do that too. All right. Zuni Ceratops, Flute Lyrebird, and Fuquisaurus. Still trying to find her. But Fuquisaurus is a... There we go. There he is. Fuquisaurus <laughs> for Friday. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, students always really loved this, and the parents loved coming in and seeing a new dinosaur every day, and they'd go, oh, my, I never knew there were so many dinosaurs. Like, really? You? So many people seem to be under the impression that there's like five dinosaurs, you know? No, we've got well over a thousand dinosaur genera that have been named, approaching 2,000. Depending on which, how many you count as being valid, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So, let's talk about Fuquisaurus right here. Fuquisaurus is an Iguanodontian dinosaur. So, related to our Iguanodon. One of our favorite dinosaurs here. And, shoot, you can even buy a, a plastic toy Fuquisaurus. I didn't realize that. But, yeah. Kind of a classic Iguanodontian shape. We're not totally sure if it had a thumb spike or not. But there we go. This is a skeletal mount at the Fukui Prefectural Museum in Fukui Province, Japan. There you go. This is so cool because the holotype fossils of this specimen are actually on display. So it's not a particularly large dinosaur. But, uh, and we don't have all that much of it. But here they actually have some of the original bones there on display so that you can see them. Oftentimes in a museum, the holotypes are kind of locked away in collections, even in like a holotype room. But here at the Fukui Prefectural Dinosaur Museum, you can see the original Fukuisaurus bones right here. And then see the rest of the skeleton reconstructed up here. There are parts of this that are going to be casts of these bones, but most of this has been reconstructed. Uh, thankfully, since we know that this is an Iguanodontian dinosaur, we've got a pretty good idea of what its overall body plan is. And I think we actually have s several good specimens of this critter nowadays, so we've got even more material than we once did. Um... Yeah. Uh, likely also belongs to Styracosterna, so it's probably got a thumb spike. Nice. More derived than Iguanodon and Uranosaurus, but less derived than Alterphinus. Huh. Uh, it could actually be a basal hydrosauroid. Hy ah. Um, or a non hydrosauroid Styracosterna. But, uh, yeah. Pretty cool critter. Fuquisaurus, one of the best-known dinosaurs from Japan in terms of fossil material, as far as I understand it. Again, not the biggest dinosaur. There it is compared to a dog. So not the most gargantuan of, uh, of dinosaurian specimens, but, you know, compared to most mammals, it's still pretty big, even today. And Paleo Nerd Italiano says there are toys made by Kyoto, Favorite, Collecta, and Takara Tomi. That makes a lot of sense because I think at least two, possibly four of those names are Japanese toy companies, right? So they'd be very excited about a dinosaur from Japan. There's, you know, some, uh, some hometown pride there for sure. 
Uh, so remains of Fukui source were discovered in 1989 in Katsuyama, Fukui Prefecture, and rocks of the Kitadani Formation. This, I think, is where the majority of Japan's dinosaurs are from this formation. Dating the, to the Baremian. So they're early Cretaceous. But, uh... Yeah. Yeah, very cool. So it makes sense. Iguanodontians are all over the world at this point. Yeah. Pretty neat. Let's look at the original paper, if we can pull that up. It's in JVP. I should have a copy of this. Let's see if I can pull that off my hard drive here. Let's see here. Uh, PDF library. Cross your fingers, this doesn't crash the stream. We're trying to draw from an external hard drive here. OBS doesn't always like that. It looks like it's working. Bukwisaurus. All right, well, that's loading. Yeah. Uh, Katsuyama Fukui. So this, that is where Katsuyama is in Japan. Whoop. Oh, come on. It's right there, this part of Japan. So on the, the main island of Honshu, right there, Katsuyama. That's where this dinosaur is from. Uh, cool, cool, cool. And it's not showing up. How, is, how do I not have this? Maybe I'm not searching correctly. Give me a second here, chat. As I'd like to find for you the original paper. We will try a different... Avenue here. Don't have it there. Who are the authors? Maybe I look it up by author. Hmm. 2003. Japan. Possible Spinosaur. Turtles. Nope. It might not be in my library, actually. Shoot. It should be kind of unusual. But anyway, Fukuisaurus. Very cool dinosaur. Iguanodontians really don't get enough attention. And, uh... Let's see. I wonder if we could find any videos on this critter. Uh, like we said, there are several different models of this animal. Paleonerd Italiano was saying this, I believe. Takara Tomi, Collect A. Yeah. Very nice. So, yeah. And what would you know it? This dinosaur shows up a lot in, uh,. In various media, like something called Dinosaur King, which I'm not familiar with, but anyway, yeah, Fukuisaurus. <laughs> it's not an animal that's known from a lot of material, but it gets an undue amount of attention, I think, because it's from Japan. So yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but good stuff. Good stuff. Anyway, Fukuisaurus. Thank you, Claire, for redeeming that. And uh, let's do our flute lyre bird, and then we'll get into Zuni Ceratops. Zuni Ceratops probably used to being last on the roster, given that it starts with Z. But uh, I've never heard of the flute lyre bird before. Let's look up this dinosaur on our Tree of Life real quick. We can also talk about Archosaurs. Uh... Actually, let's do that first. Archosaurs. So, archosaurs are a group of creatures that are still around today. In fact, there's like... Almost 11,000 species of them. Birds and crocodilians. 
are archosaurs. There's at least 10,500 species of birds, so this is a little... That counts a little low. But anyway. Today, wouldn't you know it, birds and crocodilians are actually each other's closest living relatives. So, a crocodile, believe it or not, is more closely related to a penguin or a hummingbird than it is to an iguana. Or to a tara, or a, some kind of a lizard. Crocodilians and birds are each other's closest living relatives, and I'll explain why. I know we talk about this all the time, but for the benefit of anybody who is not familiar with this, you know, hopefully you appreciate this and you'll learn something here. Um, there we go. Beautiful. This is what we call a phylogeny, ladies and gentlemen. This is an evolutionary family tree. There we go. A. Change my color here. A phylogeny. So you start with an ancestor, and you get splits, and, you know, things continue to evolve, and you get all of these different groups. So... This is a phylogeny of Archosauria, so everything that evolves from this ancestor, which is everything on here, these are all Archosaurs. Archosaurs, or uh, Archosauria, is the name of the group. Archosauria. The name means... Ruling Reptile. And, uh, yeah, this includes all of the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs start off right here. So everything that evolves from this ancestor is a dinosaur, including birds. Birds come off of this branch. They're descended from this ancestor, ultimately. So birds are dinosaurs. Birds are also dinosauriformes and ornithodirons and archosaurs. So each one of these forms kind of a concentric circle, or I guess in this case, oval, like this. And so you can go out further than this, we can go out further and further that way, and we can get to, you know, uh, seropsids, and then reptiles in general, and then amniotes, and then vertebrates, and then animals. So birds are animals, they're amniotes. Or they're animals, they're vertebrates, they're amniotes, they're reptiles, they're seropids, seropsids, they're archosaurs, ornithodirons, dinosauriforms, dinosaurs, cerisians, theropods, tetanurans, silurosaurs, manoraptoriforms, manoraptorans, and aves. Aves is birds. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, and fish, yeah, Jody Fish. I guess that would be between uh, vertebrates and amniotes, huh? So, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense, you on me? Good, good. I'm glad. So, whoops. There we go. Um. Yeah. Uh, so, archosaurs start off here. The point that I'm trying to make, you know, showing you this phylogeny right now, is that today, out of all these critters... Out of out of all of these critters, the only ones who are left are crocodile crocodilians and birds. Crocs and birds are the only archosaurs that are left. Everybody else in here, the pterosaurs, the other pseudosuchians, the dinosaurs, all gone. All these guys are extinct. And so within Archosauria, the only critters that you still have left are crocodiles and birds. Thank you, uh, Blonde AM, Blondeem, for the follow. Appreciate it. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. So, yeah. That is why, ladies and gents, 
when we look at our tree of life right here, Arcasauri, it just says birds and crocodiles. This doesn't show extinct critters on our tree of life here. It only shows critters that are still around. So yeah, there you go. Birds and crocodilians form what we call a clade. It's a group of an ancestor and all of its descendants. Here are all of its living descendants. The only living descendants are birds and crocodiles. That's why they get grouped together. But this means birds and crocodiles are each other's closest living relatives. A crocodile is more similar to this black-headed gull than it is to, say, a lizard. Because lizards are outside of this group. Does that make sense? All right. Yeah. And what's just before Archosaurus is now? That's over here. That includes turtles, too. And this is Archelosauria. There's still some controversy about this. Not everybody agrees. Uh, it's been a big mystery for a long time. Where in the world did turtles fit in? Turtles are such weird animals. They're not related to lizards. They don't seem that similar to things like tuataras. But it turns out their affinities might lie next to archosaurs. So it's like turtles are the closest thing you can get to an archosaur without actually being a true archosaur, maybe. But they belong to a group called Archelosauria, as they're currently classified. So they're kind of just outside. You take a left turn right here to get to turtles, but if you keep going straight, you get to birds and crocodiles. Dinosaurs would be, you know... Well, shoot. Dinosaurs would be right here, actually. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. Here. Um, on the way to birds. So crocodiles split off before dinosaurs do. Dinosaurs are on the way to birds right here. Does that make sense? I hope that's intuitive. I hope... I hope I'm not being too confusing about this. And Freya's Furious is based on DNA, based on DNA, based on morphology, based on, uh, you know, fossil specimens. Yeah. That's why we, uh, we now real realize that turtles are probably closer to crocodilians, but turtles' DNA is also really weird. Um, so yeah, they split a long time ago. It's hard to find. That's why this remained a mystery for a long time. They're confusing. Hmm. And Nell says, our kilo being Greek for turtle. I think it might just be kilo, but yeah. Yeah. Like a uh, Chelonian. I think if we go here, turtles might be Chelonia? Oh, Testudines. Okay. Well, Chelonia is another word. It might be Latin versus Greek. I'm not sure. But yeah, turtles. I like turtles. Uh, turtles are pretty cool, too. The turtles are very confusing, Bat Mentler. They really are. Yeah. And Gimpleg says turtles are actually descended from ground sloths. Turtles evolved way before ground sloths did, Gimpleg. Holy cow. Yeah. And so Gimpleg says turtles are closer, more closely related to birds than to chameleons or iguanas? Yes, Gimpleg, yes. Yes, indeed. Shoot. So. Turtles. And then here's birds. In order to get to chameleons and iguanas, you gotta go way up here into lepidosaurs, lizards and snakes. There's skinks and stuff. And the... Anyway, here. Let me show you. Here's turtles right here. And I'll show you what a short leap it is to birds from turtles. Bow, there you go. And then back to turtles. Yeah, real short leap. Now, from turtles to, say, chameleons, it's going to be... Let's try leaf chameleons. That sounds like a broad group. They're going to be way over there. Yeah. So, yeah. A turtle is more closely related to a bird than it is to a chameleon, which is pretty... It's kind of wild, isn't it? But... I don't know. I have to force myself to say, you know what? That's kind of wild, isn't it? Because it's not wild to me. It makes perfect sense. Um, you study these critters enough, and you get to know them well enough, and it's like, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, they've got more similarities to, uh, to birds anatomically than they do to chameleons. But anyway... <laughs> 
Yeah. And you were thinking of Archelon, the big turtle. There you go, Nell. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Archelon, I think, means, like, king turtle. I think it... it Or, like, ruling turtle. It combines arc, like an archosaur ruling, with uh, kilos, which I think is turtle. Let's look that up real quick, actually. Archelon. Everybody's favorite giant turtle. Giant sea turtle. Largest turtle ever be documented with the biggest specimen weighing... Uh, measuring 4.6 meters, 15 feet from head to tail. And uh, about 2.2 to 3.2 tons. Would have been a huge, huge turtle. Enormous. And so the name means... What's the etymology? Carapace, paleobiology, paleoecology. Yeah. Name is Archelon. Uh, genus name for the ancient Greek Arca. Oh, which is first or early. Okay, interesting. So, Arc like archaeo, like archaeology, means like ancient or first. And uh, Chelona, turtle. There you go. So, I guess that's ancient Greek. Very cool. So, not king turtle, but ancient turtle. Holy cow, look at that critter. That's uh, it's a it's a big turtle, you know. That's a turtle that's bigger than my car. Pretty neat, pretty neat. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, yeah. And uh, dinosaur Dave says it's fun to think of how many rep how many times reptiles went back into the water relative to other vertebrates. Yeah, absolutely. Reptiles probably take the cake. Because mammals, shoot, how many groups of mammals have gone back to the sea? We've got whales, we've got pinnipeds, which is seals and sea lions and walruses, and we've got otters. And you kind of had sloths too. They went back, they went into the water, and then they and then they died. Um, but sloths, sloths count. If we're counting mosasaurs, then we can count sloths. And then desmostylians, serenians. There's at least five groups of, of mammals that have gone back into the water. Uh, hippos. Hippos aren't marine yet, Juju Voodoo, but I like where your head's at. Who knows? If hippos continue to be as successful as they are, maybe one day they'll take to the oceans. You know? I'd love to see that. Yeah. And dugong. Dugongs are a type of serenian, Hugh. Yeah. And gimp like manatees, too. Here, I'll show you. We'll jump all the way from chameleons to... Sirenia. This is a group of Afrotheers. Sea cows. It's manatees, dugongs. Did you realize that chickens are a lot like little dinosaurs with feathers? I didn't. So I read a book called The Dinosaur Chicken Conspiracy. But apparently the poultry farmers don't want us to know anything about it. So they've hushed it up. Oh no. HNL, thank you so much for the 13 months. Holy cow, HNL. Thank you, thank you. Really appreciate that. That's extraordinary. Thank you, thank you, HNL. Um, wonderful stuff. Thanks for keeping me here online for the past 13 months. It's good stuff. Yeah. So here we go, yeah, sea cows. We've got four species still alive today. Yeah. African manatees, dugongs, Amazonian manatees, and African manatees. And the stellar sea cow, unfortunately, is extinct, but it belonged to that group too. So these critters are most closely related to elephants. Which is pretty cool. Yeah. And uh, and after that, you also get into hyraxes. And we'll get up here. And we'll get into, yeah, Afrotheria. Tenrex and aardvarks and golden moles. And of course, sengis, elephant shrews. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh Evane, 7375, thank you, Evane, for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, HNL says, love the stream. Always fun to relax here and learn interesting stuff. Thanks, HNL. I appreciate that. Yeah. 
And Freya's Fury says, that golden mole looks awfully green. Well, I mean, they're not made of gold. <laughs> um, should we watch a quick video? And Cherry Monetary, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Do we have a video on golden moles? Afro theorists really don't get enough attention. But, uh... Yeah. Here, let's take a look at this. Uh, apologies to anybody watching on YouTube later when I upload the VOD. You probably won't be able to hear this. But, uh... Anyway. This is from a Netflix special. This is a golden mole. You'll see. Th that's not a golden mole. That is the soon-to-be victim of a golden mole. The shark of the dunes. Yeah. Hmm. The mole with the golden... mole. <laughs> Very cool. What a neat critter. This is a mammal. Land sharks are real, yeah. Eyes covered with skin and fur. Very, very neat. A blind mammal. Wow, she is... You know, terror of the planet Arrakis. Absolutely. One of their first softer course. It's probably pretty smooth. Um, I doubt it's coarse, Freya's Fury, because that would create more friction with the sand, and it would make it more difficult for them to travel. She's She's got to be real smooth there. Yeah. Uh-oh, watch out, little insect. <laughs> so cool. A golden mole. Yeah. So a golden mole is not a mole. So this critter that you see right here is more closely related to an elephant or a manatee or an aardvark than it is to a mole. Moles are an entirely different group of mammals. Um, isn't that amazing? Like, this is this is evolution in action, baby. This is... So there is a group of Afrotherian mammals... The ancestors of elephants and, and manatees and aardvarks and tenrex and elephant shrews. And I don't know what that ancestor would have looked like, but it evolved into all of those different things, including this. This is in no way related to a mole. Like only very, very distantly related to a mole. It's much closer to things like elephants and aardvarks. So cool, you know? Very, very cool. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Just harm. <laughs> very, very cool. And are voles related to moles? Godzilla enthusiast voles, I believe, are rodents. Here. Let's let's try that. Um voles are way over there inside of Rodentia, I think, right? Voles, voles and lemmings. Yep, and muskrats. They are a kind of rodent. Yeah, hamsters, gerbils, true mice, rats and more. So this is a, a subset of Rodentia. There's mouse-like rodents, and then there's... Is this Rodentia? There's like a crazy number of rodent species. Um, where's Rodentia? Rodents. Rodentia. There you go, right there. Yeah, so voles are a kind of rodent. And they are super far from golden moles. Yeah. Who are way over there on the opposite side of the mammal family tree, practically. 
Yeah, there's 17 species of golden moles still alive, which is pretty cool. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And Rob says it's closer to an elephant than to a mole, but it's not extremely close to an elephant, is it? It's not extremely close. But it's part of this group we call Afrotheria. So it's kind of equidistant to... Well, I guess it's closer to Tenrex than it is to elephants. Tenrex are these kind of like hedgehog-like animals. Some of them are venomous, as I recall. Um, yeah, yeah. They're cool critters. They really are. So anyway, yeah. Uh, where's Afrotheria? Afrotheria. There we go. That's elephants, elephant shrews. And these guys are not... I think... I think manatees are more close to elephants than elephants are to elephant shrews. Aardvarks, tenrecs, golden moles. Yeah. So yeah, Afrotheria. Really, really cool group. Yeah, they're also marsupial moles. Yeah, so, like, being a being a mole as, like, a generic term, that's, like, a lifestyle that evolves again and again and again. There's, like, multiple, multiple groups of mammals that all evolve, you know, uh, to be small and kind of generally round-shaped and to dig underground in search of invertebrate prey. You've got moles, you've got... Well, gophers mostly eat plants, but you got gophers got marsupial moles, golden moles, uh, groundhogs, which are a kind of marmot. Yeah, anyway. And Tarquin says, sounds like the mammal version of carcinization. That's why I don't like that term very much, Tarquin, because, like, that's... You hear this all the time. Like, oh, yeah, creatures always want to evolve into crabs. It's like, no. Hold your horses, or hold your... Hold your chitin exoskeleton. Keep your chitin exoskeleton on. Different groups of crab-like arthropods evolve a crab-like architecture. You know, mammals have never evolved into, like, a crab shape. Nor have birds. Nor have... I don't know, uh, other groups of living things. It's That's an arthropod thing. Just like many groups of uh, of mammals have evolved kind of a superficially mole-like, you know, body plan. I'm a shandy. Uh. I am Amashandi. Thank you, thank you. And uh, it's better now that you're here. Thank you so much for the 18 months of support. Holy cow. Is that extraordinary? Thank you, thank you. Beautiful. And what is this I hear? What's that sound? <gasps> He's got good hearing. Uh, Foxy Ginger Kitten, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontology. Good to have you here. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Yeah. And Freya's Fury says no tetrapod has become crab-like as far as I know. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that process by which different creatures that are unrelated to each other develop a similar kind of body shape, body plan, we call this convergent evolution. And let's see if we can find a video on that, maybe. Uh, convergent evolution. Uh, let's see here. Oh, modern animals with prehistoric twins. Let's let's try that. Actually, this I bet you this is gonna be fascinating and yeah you know what we might spend the most of the rest of the stream talking about this if it's gonna go how i think it's gonna go but uh let's take a look at this there's gonna be a lot of convergent evolution discussion here i think and uh phrase fury a sauropod stuffed animal very cool phrase fury at ikea that's a, that's a find very nice and nell thank you for gifting foxy ginger, foxy ginger kitten that's lovely appreciate that nell Thank you, thank you. Um, good 
stuff. Let's continue. Yeah. Sometimes I... Uh, like, part of me, as a scientist, part of me rankles when I see an intro like this. Because it's like, no, you know, science stuff. We've got planets. And an atom. And their DNA. And the, the you know, the dropper from an eyedropper. Like, boy, it... I don't know. I... Maybe I've just been kind of, like, burned by stuff like this in the past. But, like, sometimes, you know, people will use the the various accoutrements that get associated with science. And they'll... I don't know. They'll kind of use that as the thin veneer of sciencyness when the actual video itself is not very good or... I don't know. It just seems kind of, like, performative, I guess, is the word that I'm looking for. That's not going to be the case here, I bet. It's just, they're better than this. They should have a better intro than that. I don't know. Um, they usually do better stuff here on SciShow, but let's let's take a look. Yeah. Sometimes evolution repeats itself. There are some classics yeah. that just can't go wrong. You know? Uh, yeah. Sometimes evolution repeats itself. There are some classics you just can't go wrong with. Trade evolution repeats itself there are some classics mm. you just can't go wrong with times evolution repeats itself there are some classics you just mm. can't go wrong with Trims evolution repeats itself there are some class sometimes evolution repeats itself anyway that's enough of that joke <laughs> um but yeah there are some classics you just can't go wrong with traits that are so effective for certain functions that they've evolved more than once. Think yeah. of bats and birds and insects all evolving wings. This and pterosaurs too. Don't forget, my friends, the pterosaurs. I know they were claimed by the asteroid 66 million years ago and they didn't make it through. But, you know, they were the second of these creatures to evolve flight. Insects did it first and then pterosaurs. Pterosaurs should be here and then bats. And then birds and then bats. Bats are like Johnny comes lately, you know? Johnny come lately's. Johnny's come lately. There we go. Like surgeon's general. Uh, or attorney's general. Johnny's come lately are bats. Uh, bats are very new on the scene. They only evolved like 50 million years ago. Birds evolved from their dinosaur ancestors like 170 million years ago. Um, yeah, anyway. This process is called convergent evolution, and it can help us understand the similarities between living species that aren't closely related. But when an yep. animal in the fossil record starts to look oddly familiar, convergent evolution can also help us look through time. Here are yeah. five ancient animals whose similarity to living species has allowed us to learn some fascinating details about their lives. Pterosaurs, Pretty cool. The flying reptiles of the Mesozoic era had a variety of lifestyles and a bunch of different. Now you mentioned pterosaurs. Maps, one of the absolute weirdest faces belonged to a pterosaur named Pterodostro. Yeah. Over 100 million years ago. During Very cool the critter. Period. Its super long curved snout was filled with around a thousand closely packed knee. You know, I think of it more as a whale than as a flamingo, but whatever. Um, S.V. Hargan says the attorney general is not a general. This is true, uh, S.V. Hargan, in the same exact way. In the same exact way that the Sturgeon General is not a Sturgeon. And it's therefore likely that we're here today because, by the luck of the draw, dinosaurs who had been dominant over mammals in ordinary times got felled in a mass extinction. It's true, Roses and Tea. Thank you for helping me avoid becoming felled by a mass extinction for the past 11 months through your support, Roses and Tea. Thanks for keeping me alive and kicking through your support. That means a lot. It really does. Thank you, Rosa Uh So, yeah. You would salute the sturgeon, though? Sturgeons are some of my favorite fishes. They're very cool, S.V. Harkin. They really are. Um, but anyway, critters like Pterodostro, it's almost like this looks like baleen. You know, I I think it of it's more similar to like a blue whale uh, or any other kind of mysticete whale, you know, baleen whale, than, um, than like a, a flamingo. But it does have the curved mouth, although flamingos have, have it curved the other way because they dunk their heads forehead down. But anyway, we'll we'll let 
Like we'll let Hank talk about that. A bunch of different faces to match. Well, one of the absolute weirdest faces belonged to a pterosaur named Pterodostro, which yeah. lived in Argentina over 100 million years ago during the early Cretaceous period. Its super long curved snout was filled with around a thousand closely packed needle-like teeth yeah. on the business end of a flying animal with an eight-foot wingspan. This odd structure might have totally thrown scientists for a loop, except it is very similar to a very familiar living animal, flamingos. Flamingos have pretty odd faces themselves. Their long, crooked beaks are lined with thin structures called lamellae. But we can yep. watch flamingos as they eat, so we know that these beaks are specially adapted for filter feeding. As flamingos to find this pump for you. water and mud through their beaks, tiny aquatic morsels get caught between the lamellae. Pterodostro seems equipped to do the same thing, using its narrow teeth to filter food out of water. And it's not alone. It belongs to a family of pterosaurs called Tenic Chasmatids, all of whom had long snouts with tiny teeth for filter feeding. And we don't have to guess if- Yep, and here we go. This is that art that I was looking for here in uh, Peter Wellenhofer's uh, Pterosaurs Encyclopedia. Really beautiful art here by John Sibick. This is one of those pterosaurs there. Uh, and look at that. It's like, it's almost got like a broom there in its mouth. And so we think that they would kind of sweep their jaws down into the water like that, go from side to side, and then be able to filter out all kinds of little organic goodies inside, little shrimps, arthropods, krill, whatever. Fish eggs, uh, crab eggs, whatever, you know? Turns out filter feeding can be a, a really effective means of, uh, of making a living. If you can get yourself to the right areas at the right time. Uh, beautiful and beautiful feathering, says Gianmi. Yeah. We don't, we're don't. we not 100% sure that that is feathers on these guys, but... Um, might be something different, but it probably is the same thing as dinosaur feathers. We're still figuring that part out. But yeah, really neat, right? Pterodostro. Uh, creatures like this that, that filter feed... They benefit from being able to travel long distances uh, pretty efficiently because they they typically, like, they're very good at... They have to get very good at showing up to certain areas just at the right time when fish are spawning or when crabs are releasing their eggs or when etc, etc. So, like, uh, whale sharks are a beautiful example. Um... Yeah, let's see. Uh, I think they show up near Christmas Island. When the crabs there are spawning. Uh, shoot. Whale sharks are... Um, let's see... Am I going to be able to find photos of this? I hope so. Or videos of this? Whale shark, BBC Planet Earth. Hmm. Let's see. Let me just look up whale shark real quick. This is the largest living fish. The whale shark. It's got a great genus name, too. Rinkadon. Rinkadon typus. Sounds like something you'd expect lived alongside Eoraptor. Rinkadon. But nope, they're alive today. Whale sharks. Truly, truly enormous fishes. Uh, let's see. Yep. It feeds on plankton, including copepods, krill, fish eggs, Christmas Island red crab larvae. And small nectonic life. Uh, they're such cool critters. They really are. And you can even see them in aquariums. Here's some in Okinawa. Amazing. And at the Georgia Aquarium in the U.S. state of Georgia, too. Yeah. Really uh, amazing critters. But uh, they've got this big migration. Whale shark, 
Migration, maybe? Yeah. Let's try this. The Andaman Sea and Gulf of Thailand buffer the country. And coral reefs form the basis of complex ecosystems. Hang on, that music sounds really familiar. Let me make sure this is not... Yeah, I think we're okay. Covering an area 24 times the size of Manhattan. They are refuges in the ocean's desert. And able to support up to 4,000 individual species. These hey, Liam, how you doing? Welcome, welcome. Microscopic yeah. Called plankton. Yep. Staple food for many fish. Yes, indeed. Of all shapes and sizes. It's neither a whale nor a shark. It is a shark. <laughs> it's like that old joke. Did you know that the ladybug is neither a lady nor a bug? It's like, or, or shoot, maybe, maybe it is a bug. A whale shark. Yeah. Where they go and come from is still unclear. But here they make the most of plankton blooms. Oh, and Liam was saying something about parasites. Are there parasites? Those are remoras right there, which are fishes that they kind of cling to uh, larger fishes. And they just kind of like, you know, they're like... Uh, what are they like? Um, yeah, you know, they're, uh, they're like this. Yeah. They do this, like Marty McFly, you know? They kind of hitch a ride on larger fishes like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's basically what they do. They might also eat the parasites off of those larger fishes. I don't know if Marty McFly is going to eat the parasites off of that Jeep. Probably not. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, they kind of do that. They're just catching a ride, you know? Commensalism, Sir Afghanistan. Yes, indeed, yeah. I'm not totally sure. I know that pilot fishes will eat parasites off of the, off of their ride. So it's a mutualistic relationship. I think remoras might be different. Remoras, like we see here on, uh, on the caudal fin of this big rinkadon. Big whale shark. I think I think they might they might just be in it for themselves. I'm not sure. But, here but yeah. Make the most of the motor is substantial change in evolution. If extinction didn't occur, a successful group would dominate and it would last forever. Books, bruise and booze. Nine months. Neme Nemectosaurus nine months. Yes, indeed. Books, bruise and booze. Where'd you get Nemectosaurus from? Nemectosaurus is named after the Nemegd formation, late Cretaceous of Mongolia. I don't think it has anything to do with the number nine, does it? <laughs> anyway, books, brews, and moves. Thank you, thank you for your uh, your continued support. Nine months, that's a long time. Thank you, thank you. Blooms. Yeah. And remorse do have a little pad to attach, Murph. Shoot. We're going further down this this rabbit hole here. But can we find a video on how remoras work? Yeah. The fish that attach to sharks. Here we go from Wired Science. Seriously, this image is getting darn near cliche. A fish such as a There's our whale shark again. And then we've got these remoras underneath. Right on a shark, a whale, yeah, yeah, we got it. The fish is called a remora, but it's no cliche. It's yep. actually far more fascinating than it lets on. Oh. If you guessed that the remora attaches to other creatures with suction, you'd be right. Huh. What you might not know is that the fish isn't suctioning with its mouth. Nope, with its head. Suction cup is on the top of its noggin. Mm-hmm. Check it out. Yeah. So you almost never see a remora just swimming around by itself. 
But this is its top, and that's the suction cup right there on its head. Suction cup. You know, that's the sticky part of its head that it goes thump right there, and it attaches. Yeah, pretty neat, right? Pretty neat. That hat, that hat is its highly modified dorsal fin. The same fin you'd see a shark sticking out of the water. Wait, what? Did I catch that right? So that suction cup is a fin? It's a modified fin? I did not know that. Check it out. Nice hat, brah. That hat is its highly modified dorsal fin. The same wow. thing you see a shark sticking out of the water. Yeah. When the remora is born, the fin is on its back where it's supposed to be, but migrates forward as the fish develops. Ah. Uh, what do we call this chat? Changes over an organism's individual lifespan? Like, from the time that it's born, you know, like, as it develops, changes occur. Ontogeny, thank you, thank you. Yes, indeed, Tarquin and Lenina. Not your Ontogeny. <laughs> Ontogeny, yes, indeed. Yeah, beautiful. As an effect, yeah. By attaching to larger fish and even marine mammals like dugongs. Yeah, there's a dugong. Not only gets a free ride to save energy. So you can tell this is a dugong because it's got a forked tail. Manatees just have a big, round tail. This is big and round on a manatee. On a dugong, it's a nice fork, like a like a whale tail or a mermaid's tail, I guess. Every bone that we find tells us something about how the world was. Eighty million. And Sag Twitch, I don't know why that alert cut off like that, but thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. If it's stuck uh, to a carnivore like a shark, after an attack, it'll gobble up the clouds of flesh. Ah. Uh, With its less aggro hosts. It probably intercepts parasites that fall off their skin. Like this archelosaur, a turtle. <laughs> Things like yeah. tiny crustaceans called copepods. And Freya's fury, can dugogs and manatees create viable young? I very much doubt it. I think they separated millions of years ago. Freya's fury. We'll, we can take a look at that here, actually. Here, let's go to... Uh, dugong. Right there, dugong, vulnerable. And uh, sea cows. So they shared a common ancestor 16.6 million years ago. That's a long time since they split. I very much doubt that they can still have offspring. I, yeah, I don't think so. Manatees and dugongs, I don't think they can have viable offspring at all, no. Yeah. Great question though, Freya. Yeah. I don't know if it's ever been tried, but I, I very much doubt it. Yeah. The thing is, models show. And for comparison, can we check donkey and horse? They're really recent. Like donkeys and horses have been, they've only been split for a short amount of time. So let's do uh, Equus Cabias, which is our modern horse, and it's gonna be way over there, an ungulata. There's a horse, and yep. See? Wild ass. That's basically related to donkeys, and there's donkeys. So, yeah. Um, so, only 10 million years ago, they were all together. Donkeys, I think, are pretty close to horses. I think they're actually closer than this would let on. Yeah. So, anyway, they've been separated for not nearly as long as, uh, you know. I would say that dugongs and manatees probably have got almost double the amount of time separating them. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway, good question. Good question. And narwhals and beluga, that's a great question too, Nell. Holy moly. They're really weird, though. Cetaceans, holy cow. Let's go to narwhal. Maybe we'll have to do a watch a video on, uh, on animal hybridization, too. Mammal hybridization. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, narwhals and belugas, they're, shoot, about 10 million years ago. Or 9, 9 million years ago, they separated. But yeah, they can reproduce. I don't know how viable their offspring are. But, uh, yeah, they can still reproduce. They diverged really recently. So this is what we call sister taxa. Put together correctly, the bones. <laughs> You're smart. What Very do you question. think? <laughs> <laughs> do a research on that, Oliver. I, I never... 
Puka Bear, thank you for the follow and welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Howdy, howdy. Yeah. And cetacean evolution? Yeah, very weird. Uh, not even getting into Walfins? Yeah, Nell. Certain groups of creatures, for whatever reason, can interbreed more readily than other groups, and it gets into... You know who would be a good, a, a great person to ask about this? Might be Balint. Balint actually works on genetics and epigenetics. So does Lita. Balint and Lita of Cyant Streams. Uh, we'll see... Yeah. That'd be really fascinating to talk to them about that. Yeah. Uh, and Puka Bear says, I love all things nerd, and I'm unreasonably excited about its stream. Well, welcome, Puka Bear. It is great to have you here on Paleontologizer. Shoot. Um, if it's your first time here, if it's anybody's first time here, and you haven't seen this, let me just introduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduzo. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach, you know? Talking about fossils, talking about new discoveries in the world of paleontology. And right now, we're just kind of talking about evolution. And we're going down all kinds of different rabbit holes. Whatever people are curious about, you know? We're talking about that. So that's the cool thing about modern, modern science. This is all integrative. I work on dinosaurs, you know? I dig up dinosaurs, I study them, I publish on dinosaurs. I'm a dinosaur specialist. But... Much of what we know about dinosaurs has come from the study of other kinds of creatures that are still alive today. Different animals can be kind of a window into the biology of dinosaurs. We can compare their anatomy, figure out how modern animals behave, and then use that to make testable inferences about dinosaurs. You know, different groups of creatures can teach us about different aspects of, of evolution, about animal behavior about adaptation and speciation and cladogenesis, anagenesis, all kinds of cool stuff. It's it's really amazing. Like, paleontology is such a broad science. It kind of touches every aspect of biology and geology. And so the more you know about everything, the better a paleontologist you can be, the, the better science you can carry out. And, uh, and I'm all about that here. So yeah, so welcome, Puka Bear. Glad you're excited. I hope you stick around. Let me know if you've got any questions. Yeah. Uh. But yeah. Yeah. And Fish says. Holes of the common ancestors of rabbits and other hole dwelling. There you go, Fish. Yeah. Well, shoot. Hole dwelling. Fossoriality, as we call it. That's something that evolved many, many times in different groups of animals great book about that if you're interested in the evolution of burrowing creating burrows among different animals then an excellent book for you would be ontogeny not ontogeny book by tony martin who's a uh a paleoichnologist he studies fossil traces fossil footprints fossil burrows fossil trackways fossil Poops and stuff, but he really focuses on burrows. And, uh... Oh. There we go. The Evolution Underground. Uh, by Tony Martin. Excellent book. All about the evolution of burrowing behavior. Let's see if I can find it for you. On Thrift Books. Uh... Evolution Underground. Oh boy, that's expensive. Now you could call up your local independent bookseller and, uh. Oh no, hardcover, $9.29. Very good condition. That's a steal. Somebody scoop this up. There's a link right there. Yeah. Anyway, really, really fascinating look at the evolution of burrowing behavior that we can see in the fossil record. Really cool stuff. But yeah, yeah. Uh, don't worry about it, that is ontogeny. There you go, Gertis Yes, indeed. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Wildeven said, hello again. I just listened to the Jurassic Park theme and remembered you, a dinosaur lover and scientist. Thank you, Wildeven. I really appreciate that. And welcome back. It's good to have you here. I'm flattered. Glad I was able to make some kind of impact on you. And um, it's great to have you back. Yeah. Here, let's continue talking about Remoras, then we'll get back to our other video and talk about Convergent Evolution. Remoras can slow down their hosts yeah. significantly. That, and they can end up rubbing their hosts raw. So while fish and rays don't seem to mind the Remoras, these suckers might in fact be parasitic. Ah, Remoras. Like, come on, guys. Annoying. Heard of a personal bubble? Mm. There you go. Okay, Remoras. And Nell, thank you for gifting... Ouija Deven. Really appreciate that, Nell. Enjoy, Ouija Deven. Enjoy those emotes. Enjoy not having to watch ads for the next 30 days. Thank you very much, Nell. I really appreciate that. I do. Yeah. And I saw that dinosaur deep dive. That's on our roster, Smorphosaurus. We'll be talking about Zuni Ceratops in a little bit. But we're, we're going down some rabbit holes right now. Uh... So yeah, here we go. Whale sharks migrating. Yeah. By fish that clean them. Their feed like this have to be able to travel great distances in order to be able to make a living. And so Pterodostro, our pterosaur that we were talking about, with the uh, the kind of baleen-like structure, or here they're saying flamingo-like structure. It's a good example of that. And Scallion Medallion, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Aridostro seems yeah. equipped to do the same thing, using its narrow teeth to filter food out of water. And it's not yeah. alone. It belongs to a family of pterosaurs called Tenechasmatids, all mm. of whom had long snouts with <clears throat> tiny teeth for filter feeding. And we don't have to guess about that. We can look for evidence to support the idea that they were filter feeders. And now it's one per hour now for dinosaur deep dives. But maybe, you know what? Maybe we'll make that one per half hour now. Because we've not been getting very many. Um... Let's change that real quick. Yeah. Viewer rewards, channel points. Uh, rewards and challenges. Dinosaur deep... Deep dive edit, excuse me. Um, and. Okay. Where's my limiter on this? I don't know where to find this. Notification features a few. Color reward icon. Uh, interesting. Well, shoot, where is that? Oh, here it is. I just scrolled down. Um, let's do it for every 20 minutes for today's stream. Yeah, and let's do one per stream. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, no, hang on. No, we don't want that. There we go. Now, in less than 20 minutes, there should be a new one available for you. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, yeah. Does Stegosaurus work? What do you mean, Smorphosaurus? Stegosaurus, the Pachycephalosaur, does it work? Well, they're dead now, unfortunately, Smorphosaurus, like all the non-avian dinosaurs, but... It's a valid taxon, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. Oh, it's a dinosaur deep dive! <laughs> I'm sorry, Swarm. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely works as a dinosaur deep dive. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, we'll do we'll do Xenoceratops, and we'll do we'll do Stegosaurus too. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, anyway, good stuff. Good stuff. And hey, Claire Burr, how you doing? It is Monday. Yes, indeed. Welcome, welcome, Claire. 
Let's get back to this. Talking about our... Talking about convergent evolution in different groups of fossil critters. A study uh, in 2019 described three coprolites that is fossilized... Really spectacular. Spared no expense. And thank you, Nell, for gifting Godzilla enthusiast. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, really appreciate that, Nell. Thank you, thank you. Um... And Rob says, uh, or RBRO says, filter feeder. That means they're always the earliest person in the office preparing the coffee. There you go, RBRO. That unsung hero, the coffee preparer, the filter feeder. Poops from an ancient shoreline in Poland during the late Jurassic period. The nearby sediment yeah. is covered in footprints thought to belong to a different species of tenacasmatid, and the poops are the right size and shape to have been pooped by those very reptiles. A scan mm. inside the coprolites revealed that they were full of tiny marine worms. Foraminifera, yeah, along with the of little worms and crustaceans. We see this mm, same mm. composition in some modern day flamingos. So, not only do these ancient pterosaurs have familiar faces for a familiar feeding style, they even left behind familiar feces. And just to complete the image of reptilian flamingos, the abundance familiar faces, familiar faces of footprints in varying sizes on that shoreline is an indicator that these pterosaurs might have even gathered in flocks. And as for whether they were also pink, well, we can hope and maybe someday we'll know that too. Take a trip mm. further back in time to the Triassic period. Of Vitasaurs, yes indeed. Holy cow. These critters are not crocodiles. I know you look at this and you go, you go, Danny, Danny, that's a crocodile. That's a crocodile, Danny. And I will say to you, no, that's not a crocodile. That's not a crocodile. These critters lived before the first crocodiles ever evolved. Crocodiles as we know them, anyway. This is from a different group of reptiles. This is what we call a phytosaur. And yeah, that is Smilosuchus, whose name means... Tooth crocodile? Smiley crocodile? What does Smilo mean? It's like toothy, right? Anyway. Yeah. Critters like this are called phytosaurs, which is a dumb name because when they were first found, they were thought to be herbivorous. They were thought to be, you know, plant eating. And it turns out that's completely wrong. They were not plant eaters at all. They were vicious carnivores, as you will see here. There we go. Uh-oh. So there's an early dinosaur, and here comes a phytosaur. And if I could go back and rename them to something more accurate, what would I name them as? Dinosaur Dave? Um, I would call them uh, something like pre-crocodiles. Like, um, shoot, what would that be? Something like... Uh... Archaeo pseudo crocodilians or something. That's too long though. And holy moly. Have we got a raid here? There goes our attempt to stay on topic. <laughs> Trisha Hirschberger, thank you, thank you for the raid. That is extraordinary. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. It's so good to have you here. How was your stream? Trisha, I hope it was phenomenal. Welcome, welcome to paleontologizing. Extraordinary. Yeah. Hope you had a fantastic stream. It's really, really good to have you here. And let me introduce myself real quick for anybody who might be new. Because I bet you we're going to have a lot of new people here. My name is Danny Andusa. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, as you can probably guess. Looking at my office, you are a bunch of clever folks you probably know already that a paleontologist is a scientist who studies fossils. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular, hence dinosaur paleontologist. So if any of you here have any questions about dinosaurs, again, because dinosaurs are what I study, they're what I dig up during the summer, they're what I publish on in the scientific literature, if you have any questions about dinosaurs or about any other kind of 
extinct critter. Questions about evolution, extinction, natural history in general? Don't be shy with those questions. And DM Stretch, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It's a paleontologizing. Puka Bear says, what makes something a dinosaur? Holy cow, we will talk about that after I play a quick video. Um, this is excellent. But thank you, thank you, Trisha. I, uh, I really, really appreciate your raid. Hope you had a fantastic stream. And can we get another shout-out for, uh, for Trisha Hirschberger? I want to see what they were streaming. Yeah. And, uh, Trappy Jenkins, thank you for gifting... Puka Bear there. Really appreciate that, Trappy. Thank you, thank you. That's excellent. And, uh... Company of Heroes 3. Good stuff. Uh... My face, thank you for the follow, too. Welcome, welcome. Well, to any new folks here, you're probably wondering, why is a paleontologist, of all people here, on Twitch? Why paleontology? On Twitch. Isn't this like a video game platform? Like Company of Heroes 3? I hope you had a ton of fun playing that, Trisha. Thank you, thank you again. Uh, previously recorded Danny, who is currently sneaking up behind me, is going to tell you why a paleontologist is here on Twitch right now. He'll give you the, uh, the background info that you need for all of this to make sense. So... Yeah, we will. I will leave you in his very capable hands. And uh, yeah, without further ado, previously recorded, Danny, take it away. Thanks, present day Danny. You know, people ask me all the time, Danny, how did you first get interested in paleontology? And I've always been interested in fossils from the earliest time I can remember, particularly dinosaurs. My parents like to say that I decided I wanted to become a paleontologist pretty much the moment I realized I couldn't grow up to be a dinosaur. And believe me, I tried. I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a lovely place to grow up. Except that we haven't got any dinosaur fossils here. So right after high school, I packed up and moved to Montana, one of the best places in the world to find dinosaurs. Just a couple days after I arrived in Montana, I started working at the lab at Museum of the Rockies in the paleontology program founded by Jack Horner. Jack's done a lot of amazing things in his career, but you may know him as the scientific advisor on the movie Jurassic Park. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted a credible resource that could back up several theories that we were sort of expounding. And one was that dinosaurs eventually evolved into birds. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. And that's something that Jack Horner believes in and could defend if necessary. And Jack Horner became our credibility. It was in this program that Jack built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist and how to think outside the box. I've done work at a number of other museums around the American West, helping to prep fossils, design exhibits, and educate visitors. I did a fair bit of eclectic fieldwork in various places, identifying and collecting early Cretaceous dinosaur tracks on the Idaho border, Sphenodontian fossils in the gravelly range of the Rocky Mountains, Cenozoic fishes in western Nevada. But most of my work out in the field was with Dr. Denver Fowler, who is now curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. In all, I've worked probably a few hundred sites throughout the late Cretaceous of Montana in the Hell Creek and Judith River formations, digging up dinosaurs. Lots and lots and lots of dinosaurs. And from time to time, that work has even garnered some media attention. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. And uh, much like my field work, my research focuses on dinosaurs. I'm particularly interested in their behavioral functional morphology. All these bizarre anatomical features that certain dinosaurs had, I want to know what they used them for. Right now, I'm working on a study on spinosaurs. All right, but don't ask me too much about that because it's, uh, 
It's still a project in the works, and I can't give away too much just yet till it's published. But anyway, a couple years ago, I realized that things were definitely headed downhill in Montana. So I packed up and headed back to the West Coast. And I've become kind of fed up with all the bullshit in academia, so uh, I found myself another job. I am now a teacher in early childhood education. And let me tell you, it's been a natural fit since day one. Now, given that I get to design the curriculum, my students now know more about biology, classification, and the history of life on Earth than most adults do. I've been helping raise a new generation of young scientists. Then, coronavirus hit. In mid-March, when all the schools shut down in San Francisco, I started holding classes over Zoom, and we picked up right where we left off. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things like Velociraptor's jump or Archaeopteryx's wings and all the kids. Want to see them line it up at a home museum? I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am. 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 I realized that I really enjoy teaching remotely. So back in May, I decided to try streaming on Twitch. And here we are. This is my passion, and now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? I believe that scientists ought to be public servants. Ultimately, it's our job not just to make scientific discoveries, but to teach the public about them. That's exactly what I want to do here. Now, because of COVID-19, this will be my first summer in almost 10 years with no fieldwork. I'm trying to look on the bright side, though. It's not all bad. It, at least I have more time for outreach. And I've got plenty of cool stuff to work on. And if you could throw some support my way by subscribing, I'd be incredibly grateful. So anyway, if you are new here, you should be pretty well clued in by now. And uh, I'm glad you're here. I hope you're having a good time. Anyway, let's uh, see what present-day Danny has cooked up for us. All right, present-day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. Of course, thank you even more to Trisha Hirschberger for that phenomenal raid. I appreciate that more than I can say. Welcome, welcome to paleontologizing. Yeah. Holy cow. And, uh... Oh, boy. And Godzilla Enthusiast has requested a dinosaur deep dive on a dinosaur that I'm currently working on. Shoot, actually. Godzilla Enthusiast, can I request that you pick a different dinosaur? Because I don't know if I'm going to be able to talk about that critter without getting into some of my ongoing research. And uh, there's stuff that's not yet published, I haven't presented on yet. I don't know if I can talk about that yet. This is... Uh... <laughs> uh, you're like, exactly, Godzilla. We will be talking a lot about that dinosaur. There is, there. holy cow, our perception of that dinosaur is gonna change. I can tell you that. So yeah, yeah. So pick a different one, Godzilla enthusiast. Yeah, pick a different one. <laughs> um, you don't have to redeem the thing again. Just tell me a different dinosaur, and we'll do that. But uh, anyway, yeah. We had somebody asking about what is a dinosaur. Like, what designates dinosaurs from non-dinosaurian creatures? Let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, and we looked at this earlier, but let's do it again real quick. Yeah. 
So this, again, is what we call a phylogeny. This is just an evolutionary family tree, you know? And right here, this is all, everything that appears here is called an archosaur. So, you know, you could zoom out from this and, you know, get into all of reptiles and then all of amniotes and then all of, you know, uh, you know, vertebrate animals and then all of animals and then all of life on Earth. But right here, we're looking at what we call archosaurs. Archosaurs. That's one word, but I split it up to make it easier to understand. Archosaurs, it means ruling reptiles. This is the group that dinosaurs belong to. Dinosaurs start right here. So everything that evolves from this ancestor is a dinosaur. So these are all dinosaurs. Now, archosaurs in include crocodilians who are still alive today. Uh, and Percy McGregor, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. So dinosaurs are everything from this point on. So all of these critters here are dinosaurs. That's why we say that birds are living dinosaurs, because birds evolved from a dinosaur ancestor. We can trace the evolution of birds all the way back to the beginnings of Dinosauria right there. Birds are living dinosaurs. Because these are dinosaurs here. So basically, when we say that something is a dinosaur or is not a dinosaur, this is what we're talking about. Thank you, Smarf, for gifting DM Stretch. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so does that, is this making sense so far? I hope it is. Dinosaurs are everything that evolves from this ancestor. And we can tell that something evolved from that ancestor. It's a little tricky sometimes. But, you know, we dig up their fossils, we look at their anatomy, and we can generally kind of piece things together and figure out where they belong on the great tree of life. And if they belong after this point, then they're dinosaurs. So dinosaurs are everything that evolved from this ancestor right here. So pterosaurs, the flying reptiles, you know, pterodactyls, as many people call them in the in the general public. Pterodactyls, pterosaurs, not dinosaurs. They're very close to dinosaurs, but they're not... They didn't evolve from that ancestor. They evolved from this ancestor here. So they're just outside the dinosaur family tree. So pterosaurs... Not dinosaurs. Same with, like, you know, crocodiles over here. They didn't evolve from this ancestor, so they are not dinosaurs. Does that make sense? I hope it does. That's how we as scientists classify living things nowadays. It's not based on shared characteristics. It's not like, oh, every animal that has fins is a fish. It's like, well... Uh... Or, I don't know. Everything that has wings is a bird. Bats aren't birds. Bats have got wings, you know? Bats are mammals. Because we know they evolved from a mammalian ancestor. Version of heaven. And uh, Patrick Crusader, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. So, yeah. World's first armored tank, you might say. That trunk is completely covered with thin, bony plates. RPG Fan DL, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah, good to have you here. So, yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. Uh, Friendly Neighborhood Mexican says, uh, that one at the very end where it looks almost bird-like, that's an interesting silhouette. Yeah. You're talking about this critter right here? These are Deinonychosaurs. So, that's like Velociraptor and their relatives. You would be shocked if you were to see a Velociraptor... Or another dromaeosaur or a troodontid in life. Uh, so, like, here, here's our current picture of what Velociraptor looked like. You know, a lot like this. We know it had feathers all over its body. We know that uh, it would have looked extremely bird-like. Because they're very, very close to the origin of birds. A creature like Velociraptor is extraordinarily bird-like. That's actually where birds got their, you know, their birdie features is from their dinosaur ancestors. 
from their hollow bones, to their ankle structure, to their feathers, to their wishbones. All of those things first evolved in dinosaurs. Birds just inherited them. Those are dinosaur hand-me-downs that birds got from their dinosaur ancestors. So yeah. Yeah. And uh... Yeah. You're also a pterosaur, not a dinosaur. There you go, RPG fan. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, you meant... Oh, you meant the pterosaur end. Oh, wait. Hang on, friendly neighborhood. Wait, what? Pterosaur end. You were talking about over here? So that's a pterosaur right there. Not a bird. Um, and this is a poposaur, if that's what you're talking about? Yeah. Puka Bear says, what did pterodactyls evolve into? Now here's the fun thing, Puka Bear. They didn't. Actually, that's not the... That's not the fun thing. That's the sad thing. Pterosaurs didn't evolve into anybody. They went extinct at the end of, of the Mesozoic era, at the end of the Cretaceous period. When the big asteroid hit, pterosaurs went extinct, got completely wiped out. They left no descendants. They were a dead end. In fact, if we look at this right here again, there's only two groups of creatures on here that are still around. The crocs and the birds. So crocodilians and birds are the only group of animals here that still exist today. Everybody else went extinct. All these guys got wiped out over the years. The only group that left descendants that we still have, you know, knocking around today are crocodilians and birds. Yeah. That's why today we say that these guys are each, each other's closest living relatives. Both birds and crocodilians, they form a group that we call Archosauria. So, uh... Yeah, birds and crocodilians are here on our tree of life. There you go. Yeah, birds and crocodilians are... Whoop. That was weird. Birds and crocodilians are archosaurs. Right there. Yeah. So like we were talking about earlier on the stream before this enormous, wonderful raid. Uh, we were talking about how a crocodile is more closely related to a hummingbird than it is to a lizard. Crocodiles and hummingbirds are more closely related to each other than, say, crocodiles are to lizards. Or to ataras. Or something like that. Or turtles, even. So, yeah. Yeah. That's the fun thing. They're all dead, says Godzilla Enthusiast. Yeah. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Um... So yeah, yeah. Anyway, an RPG fan says, so birds are robots, does that mean that dinosaurs were also robots? If birds were robots, then that would mean that, yeah, that dinosaurs, that would give us a clue that dinosaurs probably were too, but I know you're joking, RPG fan. But yeah, yeah. Uh, and does Chilesaurus work? It does, Godzilla enthusiast. Let's do Chilesaurus. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Anyway, before we got this raid, we were we were watching a video about convergent evolution between different groups of creatures. Like, this here is not a crocodile. This is a phytosaur. These creatures lived before the first crocodiles evolved. And, you know, over the course of life on Earth, you know, life on Earth ex has existed for like three and a half billion years, maybe more. And you get multiple times, there's like different kinds of creature evolve even if they're not related to each other so this is like a crocodile before there were crocodiles this is what we call a phytosaur you know so yeah yeah um anyway yeah maybe we'll get back into this by the end of stream but for right now we've got some dinosaur deep dives to go over let's go ahead and do those real quick um I think we had uh, Zuni Ceratops, and then we had, uh, uh, now we've got Chilesaurus, which is such a weird dinosaur. Let's talk a little bit about Zuni Ceratops. Yeah, so Zuni Ceratops, 
I think I've got some video of it here, actually. Yeah. Um. Here we go. Yeah. There's Jim Kirkland, who's, uh, I was working for Jim this past summer in Utah, back in, uh, July and August. We were digging for dinosaurs, digging up some Iguanodontian dinosaurs out there in Utah. Anyway. This is Zuni Ceratops. This is what I wanted to show you. Yeah. Uh oh. So Zuni Ceratops is an early Cretaceous Ceratopsian. They might look like Triceratops, but they're actually very different. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not actually convinced that these evolved for sexual display because it, we don't see any differences between the male and female. And that's, in order to have sexual selection, you need to have sexual dimorphism. And these dinosaurs are not like that, as far as we can tell. The males and the females look identical, you know? It's like, it's it's full, you know, full equality between the males and the females in terms of their horns and frills. As far as we can tell. So it doesn't seem like it actually evolved for like, oh, for the males to show off to the females. Females have got the same thing, you know? So I don't I don't buy that idea. But yeah. Making elephant noises. And uh Anima Zero, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Uh Odyssey Dave has got a question about carcinization. Did things evolve into the crab-like form several times as well? They did. We were just... That's actually what got us talking about phytosaurs and crocodiles and stuff. It happens again and again in evolution. It's not just crabs, but... Things evolve into a crocodile-like shape. Many, many times. Things evolve into a whale-like shape. Many, many times. Things evolve into a... Well, there's different mammals that all evolve saber fangs, like saber-toothed cats. There's different groups of theropod dinosaurs that evolve into something that looks kind of like T-Rex. Again and again, big bipedal carnivorous theropod dinosaurs. There's there's different, like... It's almost like in music, you've got like a leap motif, you know? You've got like a, a tune that comes back again and again and again but played by different instruments, you know? You've got different groups of organisms, different groups of animals that evolve a similar kind of body shape again and again and again. This has happened with crabs, crocodiles, moles, like we were talking about, moles slash gophers, um, snakes. There are lots of different snake-type critters that... Yeah. Um... Legless lizards. Shoot, lizards have lost their legs so many different times over the years. We've got so many different groups of legless lizards. And legless amphibians like Sicilians and stuff. Yeah. So it's a very efficient form. Exactly, Puka Bear. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So anyway. We'll get back into that. You stay tuned. When we get through these dinosaur deep dives, we'll, uh, we'll get back into that. Yeah, but we got to cover Zuni Ceratops right now. Uh oh. Yeah, I wonder if they actually work that way. I don't. I don't think that they had like harems like that. We typically see that in groups of animals that have sexual dimorphism. Dinosaurs, as far as we can tell, didn't. Skeletally, they're, the males and females are identical to each other. We can't tell the males and females apart looking at their skeletons. Like, shoot, if we didn't find medullary bone in, in female dinosaurs showing that they're about to lay eggs, 
we wouldn't 100% know for sure that there were male and female dinosaurs. Because, you know, shoot, they're all, they're uniform. They're, their skeletons look exactly the same as far as we can tell. So, yeah. Anyway, Zuniceratops. And we might even call that monomorphism upstairs down. Monomorphism, yeah. Yeah. Oop. And our Therizinosaur is like, what's that? Hmm. Ah, uh, food. Anyway, Zuni Ceratops. That's probably enough of these critters. Uh, enough for the video. But Zuni Ceratops, you'd be surprised to know they're not actually very big. So Zuni Ceratops is a little Ceratopsian dinosaur from New Mexico, from the early Cretaceous of New Mexico. Early or mid Cretaceous? I forget exactly when. There is a lovely reconstruction there from Creative Beast Studio. Beautiful. Really, really nice. It might look like a Triceratops, but you'll notice one key difference. Well, there's actually a ton of key differences. But anyway. To uh, a casual observer, you'll notice, unlike Triceratops, who's got three horns, Zuniceratops has got two. Yeah, no nasal horn. There you go, Smurf. Yes, indeed. And there is a Zuniceratops skull. It really is a beautiful skull. I think Zuniceratops is one of the most beautiful skulls of any dinosaur. It basically looks a lot like our a lot like our Protoceratops, but just it's got horns on it. You know? Is there a Biceratops? It used to be a Diceratops mayor space, but now it turns out it's just Triceratops. It was just it's like diseased and it doesn't have the nose horn. Anyway, yeah. Uh, so Xeniceratops Christopher, I. Uh, it's not. It's not the biggest dinosaur around. Certainly not. But it's important. Yeah. And there's. They've got lovely skeletal mounts at the Mesa Southwest Museum in Mesa, Arizona. Yeah. So yeah, very very cool critter. Uh, so like I said, not this one. It's just even smaller. But yeah, yeah, Zuni Ceratops. It's a surprisingly short article. Shoot. Uh, from the mid Turonian, so it's later than I thought. Late Cretaceous period of what is now New Mexico, United States. I think if Zuni Ceratops shows us anything, it's that, like, shoot, Ceratopsians came to North America really late. And then they just take over when they get here. Um, but yeah, these guys probably migrated over from Asia. And, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, they're pretty neat. Yeah. And I did not know this, although the first specimen discovered had single-rooted teeth, unusual for ceratopsians, later fossils had double-rooted teeth. This is evidence that the teeth became double-rooted with age, so the teeth might be changing through ontogeny. Ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny. Yeah. Uh, Ceratopsian dinosaurs typically have double-rooted teeth, which is what we'd expect, especially later Ceratopsians. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Zuni Ceratops, what a cool critter. Let's see if I can find the original paper. Uh, 1998. Betcha I can find that here. Uh, Zuni Ceratops. Come on now. Gotta have that 98 paper, right? And what does single slash double rooting mean? That means the teeth have little roots. Here, I'll show you. Um, yeah, Ceratopsian teeth. There we go. So you've got the crown up there. That's the part of the tooth that actually like does the chewing. Then you've got the root, the root of the tooth. So, yeah, double-rooted. Like that. 
So yeah, pretty cool. Dinosaurs shed their teeth all the time. They're always growing new teeth and spitting the old teeth out. It's just something that dinosaurs did. Most creatures with teeth are like that, honestly. But uh, mammals are... We are kind of the weird exception. We only have we only have two sets of teeth for our whole life. That's bizarre for an animal, you know. Mammals are strange like that. But yeah, yeah, double rooted right there. Does that make sense? What's the advantage? Stability, maybe. I don't really know. You know, Ed, I don't know enough about teeth. I would like two roots, more secure than one, maybe, but. That might not necessarily be true. I'm not sure. Yeah. And someone called Dragnar... <laughs> Ragnarokker says uh, mammals have a, a free trial and then they pay to keep their teeth. Yeah, we gotta go to the dentist. Shoot. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, hang on a sec. Somebody's hunking outside my window. Let me keep an eye on the 3D printer while I check on Never a dull moment in this neighborhood. But, uh... Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Zuni Ceratops. And here is the original descriptive paper of Zuni Ceratops. Whenever we do a dinosaur deep dive, I try and show you what the original descriptive paper looks like. You know, I feel like as a scientist... I read scientific papers, you know, every day. But most people in the general public, you've got no exposure to this kind of thing. <laughs> and Belvin, the Ohioan, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Are you are you watching from Ohio right now? Welcome, welcome. I feel like most people in the general public, most regular folks. You're, you're not you're just not going to be exposed to a scientific paper and that kind of distance can breed you know, like a suspicion of science it's like well scientific papers pfft, I've never seen one of those love and justice what did you want to show me uh thank you thank you love and justice thank you thank you for the follow appreciate that I don't know. For most regular folks, like, you hear about scientific papers on the news, maybe? Or maybe on, like, drive time radio in the morning on the way to work? Like, oh, scientists, you know, you got these chirpy, you know, radio station hosts. And it'd be like, uh, well, oh, well, in the news today, uh, uh, scientists have discovered that, uh, that chocolate is actually, uh, good for you and can, uh, can help, uh, reduce aging or something like that. Then their host goes, oh, ha, 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 I love that. I love chocolate. You know, and it's like that's maybe the only time that you hear the word scientific study in a given day. That's maybe your only exposure to this is like filtered through media like that. And I think it's important to actually show you what a scientific paper looks like. So this sort of thing seems less mysterious, less distant, you know. So let's get this straight from the science horse's mouth. This one doesn't look the most visually engaging, but this is the original paper describing Zuni Ceratops. This is how we as scientists communicate ideas to one another across the world. We write up a paper, we submit it to a scientific journal, other scientists check it, they make sure that, that nothing's like egregiously wrong with it, and then it gets published in a journal. And then other scientists take a look at it and... They can write a rebuttal to it, or they could write other papers that are, you know, uh, maybe building on this. Yeah, this is how we build the scientific literature. So this is the paper establishing Zuniceratops. A new Ceratopsian dinosaur, Zuniceratops christopheri, is here and described from the lower part of the Moreno Hill Formation. Cretaceous period, Turonian stage in the Zuni Basin of West Central New Mexico. Uh, it exhibits a combination of characters unique among horned dinosaurs. Anyway, the abstract up here is kind of like a summary of the paper. I rarely read a whole paper. Uh, 
you know, in my daily study, usually you read the abstract, and then if the abstract is really intriguing, and if it's relevant to your own research, then you read the whole paper. We'll just kind of skim through this. Uh, here is where this was found, right here. There's our study area down there in western New Mexico. Here is a strat chart, kind of showing where these specimens were dug up. And so there you go, Moreno Hill Formation, Middle Tyronean, nice. And then if we're lucky, we'll have some figures, there we go. So this is like photocopied from the actual journal article. This is still back in 1998 before these things were online. But yep, different skull bones right there. Uh, and there's a horn, beautiful, yeah. Abstracts for the win, there you go, Gojira, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Fatality. Thank you, Patrick Pirate. <laughs> 26 months, that is. Almost a whole year. Thank you, thank you, Patch. Really appreciate your ongoing support. It really does mean a lot to me. Thank you, Patrick Pirate. Patrick Pirate, a scientist herself. Patrick Pirate can tell you all about abstracts and about how it... It is a shame that, like, more of the general public doesn't get to see scientific papers. They can be kind of dense and dry, but... I think it's important to show this kind of thing, you know? Um... Yeah. Yeah. When we talk about a scientific paper, this is what we're actually talking about. This is from a journal there. So, yeah. Uh, by Douglas Wolf and Jim Kirkland. Jim Kirkland, I worked with him this past summer. I'm working with him again this next summer. I'm working with him on Leoningosaurus. Uh, which is why I'm not going to be talking about that dinosaur. We've got unpublished information about Leoningosaurus. It's going to change the way we think about this animal. But anyway, there's Zuniceratops. And uh, thank you for requesting it, Claire Burr, right? Yeah. Uh... But yeah, yeah. Anyway. And so many footnotes. Absolutely, Puka Bear. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And we can do Stegosaurus. Yes, indeed, Smorphosaurus. Let's do that right now, shall we? Uh, uh, Raven of Trivia. Uh, no, Raven of Rivia. Sorry. Raven of Rivia. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing Raven of Rivia. Good to have you here. <laughs> ah, so next up for our dinosaur deep dives, let's take a look at a classic Cretaceous Pachycephalosaur dinosaur. Everybody is familiar with Pachycephalosaurus, of course. Uh... Yeah. Uh, here we go. You've seen this in the movie The Lost World Jurassic Park. Yeah. It's funny, because a full-grown Pachycephalosaurus would be bigger than this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway. Yeah, that's a Pachycephalosaur. That's Pachycephalosaurus, which is the best known of the Pachycephalosaurs. I've dug up some Pachy material before in the Hell Creek. Uh, Stegosaurus here is a smaller, slimmer Pachycephalosaur. Looks, you know, uh, there it is compared to a cat. I don't think they had quills like this, but 
A lot of artists just love putting that on there. Anyway, Stegosaurus, not a particularly huge dinosaur. We're doing a lot of smaller dinosaurs today, aren't we? Yeah. Um, but the there's the skull of this critter, and that is just a solid bone dome on the top of the animal's head. It's uh, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Uh, I actually have a Pachycephalus uh, Stegosaurus, excuse me, a Stegosaurus skull that I 3D printed. You can get your own here. Um, yeah. Oh, there we go. This is really neat. Here's the skull exploding. Well, it's loading, and then it'll be exploding. There you go. Oh, I love this so much. This is so cool. Because Pachycephalosaurus skulls, we often think of them as just being really, really solid. Um, you know, like this. But they're made up, just like any skull, of a bunch of different bones. Let's protect our bones. Because if they're removed, America loses them forever. And Amelia Bedelia, thank you for converting that Prime sub to a Tier 1 recurring sub. Thank you, thank you, Amelia Bedelia. Very, very much for your support. Thank you, thank you. That is excellent, and I really appreciate it. Yeah. So, uh, here is... Stegosaurus, right here. Really, really cool. There's that skull. Here is the eye socket. There's the nares, the nostrils right there. You can see the teeth underneath. There's that dome on top of the skull. There's that shelf. It shows that this is a marginocephalian dinosaur. They usually have that shelf like that. And uh, there's those different bones coming apart and then coming back together. And there's the brain inside. This is really cool because after this was scanned... We actually got a good picture of what the inside of the the brain case looked like, and thus what the brain would have looked like. Really, really cool. So there's the brain in purple right here, with various nerves attached to it. And then we've got some sinuses up front right there, attached to the brain. Uh, really, really cool. Stegosaurus, what a neat dinosaur. So Stegosaurus is from the late Cretaceous period of Canada. And uh, talk about a bonehead, that's what this group of dinosaurs is sometimes called, Amber Vicks. They're sometimes called boneheads. Yeah. Um, which, you know, is it any wonder they'd be called boneheads? With a head like that? Yeah. <laughs> very, very cool. Uh, Stegosaurus, such a neat dinosaur. They're really, they're really pretty cool. I like them a lot. Yeah. There's a lovely illustration of Stegosaurus. I like that very, very much. I actually 3D printed a Stegosaurus skull. Let me find that real quick, and then I'll show you. But let's check on our 3D printer while it's, while it's going, yeah. And thank you, MZV5005, for your follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't put this together yet, nor have I cleared away the supports or anything. But here is my 3D printed life-size Stegosaurus skull like that. You can see how thick that dome is. Pretty extraordinary, right? Yeah. So one of these days I'll have some time. I can uh, I can sand this down. I can glue it. I can remove the supports. I can uh, fill in some of the gaps and everything. Yeah, Stegosaurus. What a cool little dinosaur. These guys were little herbivores. They may have also possibly... Possibly eaten meat, too. Um, yeah... There we go. Here's an article that... Oh, uh-oh. Oh, no. Come on. Gah. 
Here. Try this in a different browser and see if it still gives us trouble there. There we go. Oop. There we go. Yeah. But I actually had a hand on this, sort of. Um, I was supposed to be presenting at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting a number of years ago. And I couldn't afford to go. I think this was 2018. And uh, I was supposed to be there in New Mexico. Couldn't make it. Um, but I got contacted by National Geographic. They wanted to look at and my research and interview me about it. And I said, well, shoot, I'm not actually there. I, uh, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't able to afford to. I couldn't afford to go to the meeting this year. But I said, you know, Mark Goodwin has a really, really cool dinosaur presentation. You should check that out. That would make an excellent story. And so John Pickrell here uh, said, yeah, okay, sounds good. And this is the article that he wrote about it. So yeah, yeah, about Pachycephalosaurus. Uh, the history of life, it's very quirky, fortuitous, chancy character. We are yep. literally here only because of the good fortune of dinosaur extinction. Seven Inkling. Now do a year. Appreciate you, Inkling. Thank you, thank you. For the seven months of support. Holy moly. That's extraordinary. It really is. Yeah. Good stuff. Thank you, Inkling, for keeping me here on the air for the past seven months. I appreciate it. Yeah. So in the front of this weird pachycephalosaur jaw... Part of, the spe part of the species never found fossilized before. The specimen had bared sharp, triangular, blade-like teeth that look more like those seen in carnivores such as Tyrannosaurus and Velociraptor. It is unclear if the species had these teeth temporarily during its youth or if they were a permanent fixture for the dinosaur. So yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. And Steve Brusati says, I've studied carnivorous theropods for 15 years, and I'm pretty sure if you handed me a tooth like that, I would say that's a theropod tooth, he says. That's a combination of a beak with these very sharp, steak knife-like steak, steak knife serrated teeth. They must have been eating some kind of meat. Why else would you have steak knives at the front of your mouth? So maybe Pachycephalosaurus ate meat, too. Yeah. So yeah, Mark Goodwin and Dave Evans were presenting on this. Yeah. Um, very cool stuff. Yeah. Now the dinosaurs rule. And uh, T with Audrey, thank you for the follow. Teeth, T with Audrey, teeth with Audrey. We're talking about teeth here. Anyway, Audrey, thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate it. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. And oh, well, what do you know? Who's this dingus who gets quoted in the article here? <laughs> uh and uh. Why would a baby pachycephalosaurid have sharp teeth? Someone called Ragnarokker. They're probably doing different things at different growth stages. Probably when they're young, they're eating different things than what the adults are eating. We know these dinosaurs change a lot through ontogeny. They change a lot as they, uh, as they grow up through time. These triceratops growing and growing and growing. What do we call Ontogeny. That? Ontogeny. Yes, indeed. Pachycephalosaurus was also changing a lot through ontogeny, too. Ontogeny. So, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, their skulls are changing so much that we used to think that they were different species at different growth stages, you know? Now we recognize, shoot, it's the same animal, just at different growth stages. It looks so different. It's, it's so distinct from how mammals work today, where, like, one creature is doing the same job its whole life, you know? It stops drinking mother's milk, and it starts eating whatever the adults are eating. And it's got one niche for its whole life. Dinosaurs were not like that. They're moving through different niches, different, different jobs in their ecosystem. It's like, I live here and I eat this when I'm a baby. Then I move over here and I eat something different when I'm a, a juvenile. A sub-adult, I change. An adult, I'm living somewhere else. I'm eating something different. It turns out a lot of dinosaurs are probably doing that. 
So yeah. Yeah. Adri says, teeth, both good and necessary. Yes, indeed. Salute to you, too. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's, uh... It's really good to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. So, who, what does this dingus say? Most scientists like to place dinosaurs in a neat category, says Danny Anduza of the University of California Museum of Paleontology, who has himself helped excavate several Pachycephalosaurus fossils. What makes this study so exciting is that the authors use new evidence to challenge some of those assumptions. So the work also highlights the importance of continued fieldwork. Well, yeah, shoot, just this one jawbone can help change the way that we think about this whole group. Yeah. Even after all these years of collecting, the discovery of just one new specimen can change the way we look at a dinosaur group, Anduza says. Oh, shoot, I'm plagiarizing myself here. Or I'm repeating myself. I think that's pretty inspiring. It's a reminder to get out into the field as often as possible, and always look over the next hill. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you a link to that article if you'd like to read it in full. So, yeah. Whether it's Pachycephalosaurus or Stegosaurus, these are really fascinating animals. And, uh... Yeah. We still don't know enough about them. Pachycephalosaurs are still kind of a mystery in a lot of ways. And one of these days, I'll get Kerry Woodruff. I'll see if I can get him as a guest on this, uh... On this channel, we can, uh, we can talk to Kerry Woodruff on Pachycephalosaurus, because he, he's a friend of mine, formerly of Museum of the Rockies, and, uh, he just did his PhD on Pachycephalosaurus under Dave Evans. And I'm sure he'd have some really interesting stuff to say about their diet, and just how weird these creatures are as animals. There's a 1924 illustration of this critter. I love these old illustrations, but they are, oh boy, are they out of date. But yeah, Stegosaurus. Just just a little guy, you know? Just just a little guy. And there's that same specimen that I have a 3D print of. Right there. Yeah. Just just a little guy. But they're man, are they charismatic. I love Pachycephalosaurus. They're they're weird and cool and uh We're so lucky to have them, you know? Like what What a weird cool animal. Love these guys. Uh, can't be more confusing than all the Iguanodon stuff. I don't know. We've got less material from Pachycephalosaurus. Nobody has ever found a complete skeleton anywhere of a Pachycephalosaur. And these guys are only around at the very end of the Cretaceous period. Like, Pachycephalosaurs first show up... Shoot. Like, in the late Cretaceous, I think? Man, the... Imagine what they could have done if that asteroid hadn't hit, you know? These guys were in their... Pro they were... They were destined to do great things. And they were snuffed out. So, yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't want to headbutt that guy? Yeah. DM stretch. Although... Could these animals actually butt heads? As they are often portrayed doing. I think... Probably not, but, uh, yeah, I think, uh, let's see, where was that? Uh, Haley World, Pachycephalosaurus. Um, I, I swear they had an episode about Pachycephalosaurus, didn't they? I thought they did. Um, looking, looking, looking. Kangaroos, Tyrannosaurus, sauropods, trackways, mammoths, rhinoceros. Uh, where's our, uh... Yeah, shoot. Did they not have an episode about Pachycephalosaurus? I thought they did. 
maybe I'm like completely misremembering this. That's that's so funny. Huh. Yeah, anywho. And Smurf, I will see you later. Thanks for being here. Yeah. And uh Yeah, anyway. And uh Oh, and Ragnarokker was asking about yeah, let's talk about ontogeny in Pachycephalosaurus. Um Yeah. So Pachycephalosaurus is really, really important because it basically helped to transform our view of dinosaur ontogeny. Let's talk about that a little bit here. Yeah, here we go. These three animals are related. And so here is my old boss, Jack Horner. Uh, not Jack Horner from the nursery. I've been talking about paleontologist Jack Horner. Uh who used to be the state paleontologist of Montana. He might still be. I'm not sure. But, uh... Anyway. Yeah. So he's trying to figure out, like, what's going on with these different dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous period. This video was produced long enough ago. He did this TED Talk long enough ago that it's still 65. We now know it was 66 million years ago. We've got better dates now. Um, right here. But, yeah. Anywho. He's trying to figure these critters out. We will evaluate them. Yeah. And that's sort of what I've been doing. So my students, my staff, we've been cutting them open. Now, as you can imagine, cutting open a leg bone is one thing, but when you go to a museum and say, you don't mind if I cut open your dinosaur skull, do you? They say, go away. <laughs> so. And this is true. This is true. A lot of collections managers, they're not they're not fans of Jack Horner, you know? Yeah. And Cadmos says, longest dinosaur name, common name like T-Rex. The longest dinosaur genus name is Micropachycephalosaurus, Cadmos. It has 24 letters. But Micropachycephalosaurus is probably not a pachycephalosaur. It's a dubious genus anyway, so I don't know. We should really probably get rid of that name. But yeah. Yeah. So, here are 12 dinosaurs, and we want to look at these three first. So, these are dinosaurs that are called pachycephalosaurs. And everybody knows yep. that these three animals were related. Yep. And the assumption is, is that they're related, you know, like cousins or whatever. But no one ever considered that they might be more closely related. In other words, hmm. people looked at them and they saw the differences. And you all know that if you are going to determine whether you're related to your brother or your sister, you can't do it by looking at differences, all right? You can only determine relatedness by looking for similarities. So people yep. were looking at these and they were talking <laughs> about how different they are. Pachycephalosaurus has a big, big thick dome on its head and it's got some little bumps on the backs of its head. And it's got a bunch of gnarly things on the front of its nose. Yep. And then Stygimoloch, another dinosaur. It's right here. From the same age, lived at the same time, has spikes sticking out the back of its head. It's got a little tiny dome, and it's got a bunch of gnarly stuff on its nose. And then there's this thing called Draco Rex, Hogwarts Eye. Yeah. Guess where that came from? Dragon. So here's a dinosaur that has spikes sticking out of its head, no dome, and gnarly stuff on its nose. Yep. Nobody noticed the gnarly stuff sort of looked alike, but but they did look at these three and they said, these are three different dinosaurs and Draco Rex is probably the most primitive of them and the other one is more primitive than the other. I, it's unclear to me how they <laughs> actually sorted these three of them out. Yeah. If you line them up, if you just take those three skulls and just line them up, they line up like this. Draco Rex is the littlest one, Stygimoloch is the middle-sized one. Pachycephalosaurus is the largest one, and one would think, "Yep, that should give me a clue." <laughs> but it didn't give uh. me a clue because, well, we know why. Scientists like to name things. Yep, so, it's true. 
we are human beings and we have egos and it's you know you got to fight that instinct sometimes as a scientist you know yeah david delaun says why would you need to cut it open to do what we call histology i think jack will explain that in a little bit take a look if we cut open draco rex i cut open the, our draco rex what i tell you okay. it was spongy inside yep really spongy inside i mean it is a juvenile and it's growing really fast so it is going to get bigger if you cut open Stygimoloch, it is doing the same thing. The dome, yep. the dome, that little dome is growing really fast. It's inflating very fast. Yep. What's interesting is the spike on the back of the Draco Rex was growing very fast as well. The spikes on the back of the Stygimoloch are actually resorbing, which means they're getting yeah. smaller as that dome is getting bigger. Interesting. Like Pachycephalosaurus. Pachycephalosaurus has a solid dome and its little bumps on the back of its head were also resorbing. So yeah. just with these three dinosaurs, you can easily, you know, as a scientist, we can easily hypothesize that it is just a growth series of the same animal. Mm -hmm. which there you go. Which means that Stygimoloch and Dracorex are extinct. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Which, of course, means we have 10 primary dinosaurs to deal with. Yeah. Anyway, I'll give you the link to the rest of this video. It's really excellent, actually. Wonderful TED Talk about dinosaur ontogeny. From my old boss, Jack Horner. It turns out the whole situation with, uh, with Draco Rex and Stygimoloch... Of course. Yeah, might actually be a little bit more complicated than this, because while all three of these dinosaurs are from the Hell Creek Formation, we don't really find these guys at the top of the Hell Creek Formation. We only find them at the bottom so far. So there could be a couple things going on. It could be that we just haven't found them there yet. We're not looking hard enough. We don't have enough fossils yet. We don't have a large enough sample size. That's a possibility. Or it could be that at the end of the Hell Creek Formation, you know, they're not getting to this growth stage anymore. It could be that they're undergoing what we call pedomorphosis. You know, or neoteny. You know, it's like the adults look more and more like the juveniles. And this is a pattern that we see all over the place in evolution. There's a lot of different groups of animals that do this. Axolotls are kind of a classic example. Um, here. Uh, axolotl ontogeny, maybe? Yeah. Here, let's take a look at this. In Aztec mythology, the legend of the five suns is the creation myth of our world. The dawning of the fifth sun brought about the era in which humans yeah. were created, and is the era in which we currently live. According to the myth, this sun was created by God. <laughs> big time, big boy. How are you doing? Welcome back. <laughs> it's good to have you here. Uh, we have no idea if dinosaurs were edible. I don't. I think they might have some ideas about whether or not you were edible. Big time, big time, big boy. It's great to see you. Long time no see. Welcome back to paleontologizing. Howdy, howdy. How is everything? Welcome back. Yeah. Uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> you taste delicious i'll take your word for it big time i'll take your word for it but i'm glad you're here welcome back yeah but was not able to yeah. across the sky and hang on a minute uh cadmos says are all birds dinosaurs uh every single one of them that ever existed evolved from dinosaurs i question well cadmos i mean it's fair to question that but we got to look at the evidence you know in a situation like this, you know, so here, we're going to have to kind of like go all the way back to like evolution 101 for discussion about this kind of thing. And this is, it's frustrating sometimes because especially here in the United States, almost nobody learns the first thing about evolution until like college. And that's only if they take a biology class. Creationists 
have fought so long and hard to keep this kind of thing, you know, out of out of public schools, and they've been largely successful with it. You know, people aren't learning biology because creationists, you know, they they fight so hard to keep these things out of the textbooks. So yeah, here. Here's a clip of Kevin Padian. I remember grabbing this a while ago. Um because it it absolutely deals with what we're talking about here. Uh Here we go. This is like again, Evolution 101, which it's so frustrating to me because this is this is what explains everything. This is this is how we learn about where we came from, you know? This should be in every textbook and it is when you actually look in you know when you actually learn about evolutionary biology you know these are the the fundamental ideas in it but it's not in school textbooks because the creationists fight to keep it out anyway here I mean, if you just look any good fish it has uh, scales on its back and fins here we'll go back a little bit talking about these fishes uh Oh, that's going to be kind of a longer detour, but it's going to be good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you know, this is kind of talking about, like, the, you know, uh, evolution versus creationism. Yeah. ...of the textbook that Bill Buckingham had called Laced with Darwinism. <laughs> oh. oh, man. That's my birthday. What is... Yeah. My date of birth, September 26, uh, 2005. <laughs> I may have been born in a different year, but that's my birthday, September 26th. Yeah. And Kadmo says, not everything can be explained by science, just saying? I mean, how do you know that? It's a bold claim, you know? LT424, how are you doing? Thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. And to me, saying that all birds are dinosaurs is exaggerating, and exaggerating is a form of lot. That's not exaggerating, though, Kadmos. Birds come from a common ancestor. That's why all birds have got the same DNA. It all goes back to a common ancestor. We know this for a fact. It's it's incontrovertible, you know? We we know that all birds evolved from a single common ancestor. We now know that that ancestor was a dinosaur, you know? It's not exaggerating. It's shoot, you know? It's like it's like saying, well, it'd be exaggeration. It would be exaggeration to say that uh that you know, that all whales um you know, uh, that they, uh, have bones, you know? We don't know that. Maybe there's a whale that doesn't have bones. It's like, well, no, we've seen a lot of whales. They all have bones, you know? We can look at the DNA of birds. Every bird that's ever had its genome sequenced, we see the same, you know, the same structure in its DNA. We know that all of these critters are related to each other, and we can tell they all evolved from a single common ancestor. Probably about 160, 170 million years ago. We're still kind of working out the details there, but, like, it all converges down to a point. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and Wales doesn't... Oh, Wales the country? There, I, I bet you if you were to visit Wales the country, DK79, there's people there and they have bones. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh... Stevie's Yerda, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Got a sub badge there. I don't recognize that name, but welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Science provides a decent way to make those models. I mean, that's the thing, is that, like, people who try and use their... Science and religion are two different things. You know, science makes predictions about the natural world, and we test those predictions, and... They either hold up or they don't. Religion is different. That's like a different mode of thinking entirely. These religion and science do not have to be in opposition to each other. I mean, that's the thing. Like the vast majority of religious people around the world have zero problem with science. But that's absolutely true, you know? And yeah. The vast majority of, you know, 
Hindus and Sikhs and Muslims and Christians and Jews and uh, Zoroastrians and other other religions all around the world. You know, they don't have problems with the idea of gravity or the idea of the germ theory of disease or meteorology, weather science or geology or biology, evolution, you know? Yeah. If you're going to take your religion and interpret it in such a way where you go, well, you know, it, I, it can't possibly be that living things change over time. Def definitely not. You're setting yourself up for failure. That's a house built on the sand. It's going to get washed away. You know the parable. Don't do that. <laughs> it's... Oh, boy, you're setting yourself up for failure, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, let's, uh... Is evolution? What is evolution? Yeah. Dr. Miller, what is evolution? And so this is from a, a documentary from PBS Nova about the intelligent design trial Kitzmiller versus Dover in 2005. And uh, here is one of the attorneys, uh, attorneys, um, interviewing a scientist, Ken Miller, who is himself an evolutionary biologist and a devout Catholic. So let's see where this goes. Most biologists would describe evolution as the process of change over time that characterizes yep. the natural history of life on this planet. And what was Darwin's contribution to evolution? Darwin pointed out that there's a struggle for existence, whether we like to admit it or not, he realized that those organisms that had the characteristics that suited them best in that struggle, those were the ones that would hand those characteristics down to the next generation, and that therefore the average characteristics of a population could change in one direction or another, and they could change quite dramatically. And so this is a dramatic, dramatically, this is a dramatic recreation from the transcripts of that trial. It was really like a trial for the ages. Really, really fascinating stuff. Kitzmiller versus Dover. I'm not interested in court cases or anything. Like, I don't know. This stuff makes me... Yeah. Ugh. But uh, it's really interesting how science actually made its way into the courtroom here. And it became a trial about science. And a bunch of scientists got to testify. And uh, this is about, you know, a group of school teachers who uh, decided that they wanted to teach creationism in a public school. Or no, sorry. There was a... Uh, it was a school administrator or a board member who tried to teach creationism in a public school. He, like, tried to put a bunch of creationist textbooks and stuff like that into a public school. And the science teachers objected. They're like, this isn't science. This doesn't make any sense. This is creationism, you know? It's inherently untestable. And there was a big trial about it. This is what that's about. And that's the essential idea of natural selection. Yeah. Starting with Ken Miller. There you go, RPG. Yeah. <laughs> the conflict at the heart of this case. Yeah. Miller testified how Darwin's theory pictures the history of life. So you do um, dig up dig up dinosaurs? <laughs> well. I do. Yeah. <laughs> Grand level news, holy cow. How are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. What's shaking? Great to have you here. Uh, you're doing some just chatting? Beautiful. Independent and street journalists. Have I seen your streams before, just ground level news? There's something about, um, it's like advocating for unhoused people in Salt Lake City. Is this the same same lovely channel? The people I'm talking to right now? Holy cow. You're calling your local legislatures. Le legislators. Well, good for you, Ground Level News. Holy cow. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. If any of you are looking for some, uh, some cool Ground Level journalism here on Twitch, go follow Ground Level News right now. Do not delay. Uh, excellent. K-Variables has nailed it been a long time but holy cow uh it's wonderful to have you here um, uh, iguanodon 
an iguanodon on him. Um, and Saurus Cloud, Saurus Cloud, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. This is a step-by-step -step guide to becoming a fossil. Step one, die. Uh-oh. Uh, Majot50. Thank you so much, Majot, for the 14 months of support. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Can we get one more shout-out for, uh, for Ground Level News? I'd appreciate that. Welcome, Ground Level News. Great to have you here. We're actually talking about the teaching of, you know, the foundational concept in biology. The concept that living things change over time. Evolution. We got off on kind of a, a, a tangent here. A rabbit hole, if you will. We're talking about this trial. So I guess it is legislature related. We're talking about this trial, the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial, and watching a, a clip from a documentary about that. Uh, unfortunately, here in the U.S., there are a lot of people, a depressing number of people, who are really afraid of or offended by the concept that living things change over time, that they're not static, that creatures can evolve. This is something that we see left and right throughout the fossil record. This is, that's literally the story of life on Earth, is things changing. But a, a lot of people are really opposed to that idea. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get back into this. But yeah. Uh, and yeah, MacGyver, it's, yeah. Uh, we also have people offended by the idea of creationism. I'm not offended by that, Cosmos. I grew up with that. That's... <laughs> That's what I was taught growing up. It took me a long time to realize I was being lied to. That's not how things actually work, you know? Like, actually... Going out and studying fossils, digging these things up, working in museums, talking to scientists, working on this stuff, I realized all these things I'd been taught growing up were lies. I'd been lied to. You know? Living things change over time. They don't stay static. So yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um. So yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to talk too much about my background right now, or, uh, but yeah, let's continue. With species gradually Here. And that's the essential idea of natural selection. Yeah. Starting with Ken Miller, the plaintiffs walked Judge Jones through the conflict at the heart of this case. Miller testified how Darwin's theory pictures the history of life as a tree. We talk about this every stream, yeah. Evolving into others over millions of years, producing. So sometimes we use a tree, sometimes it's a fractal. There's different like visual aids that you can use for this kind of thing, but usually a tree is our standard one. And when I talk about the tree of life, it's kind of a, you know, a model that we use for kind of envisioning how different living things are related to one another. You know, you've got a branch. There's like one lineage that evolves, and then it splits, and those are the branches that come off. You know, it, it's not a tree in a literal sense. It's not a physical tree, obviously. But it's a way of thinking about common descent, branching evolution. Yeah. New branches and twigs, a process that gives rise to all the variety of life. Yeah. From bacteria to Darwin's finches to ourselves. Yep. But intelligent design takes a different view. As the moon yeah. This is what I was taught growing up. Intelligent design teaches a history of life in which organisms appear abruptly, are unrelated, and linked only by their designer. Hmm. Which, you know, the thing is, when you start finding intermediates between some of these, it's like, well, shoot, we found a creature that's halfway in between, say, this one and this one. It kind of disproves this whole idea, you know? We have that with various dinosaurs now, with Despletosaurus, Triceratops, you know, the list is ever-growing. Dinosaurs are not a great example. 
We've got many, many other different kinds of fossil organisms for whom we have many, many more specimens. It takes a long time to dig up a dinosaur. It's a, a tremendous amount of work, and they're not very common as compared to, say, foraminifera, these tiny microscopic fossils that we have literally like thousands upon thousands of. You know, and we can trace their evolution through time. We could watch them evolve if you line them all up according to where they were where they were excavated from. Or rather, usually they're from like a core sample. So you can just walk up the core and then you see like, oh yeah, they're changing, they're changing, they're changing, they're changing, they're changing, they just keep changing. And sometimes it's a slow, gradual change like that. It's pretty cool stuff. What's really being added yeah. is the idea that organisms poofed into existence uh, through the miraculous act of an intelligent designer i.e. God. Um, that's the view that intelligent design promotes. So how can scientists be so sure Darwin's tree accurately represents the history of life on Earth? Hmm. As it turned out, the... And I, I kind of hate that, too. It's not Darwin's tree. Like, Charles Darwin was one of the very earliest scientists to ever tackle this kind of thing, you know? He got a lot of stuff wrong back then because he was working with really limited information. Darwin didn't have a whole lot of fossils to go on, for instance. He spends a big part of his book, The Origin of Species, kind of apologizing for the fossil record and going, like, shoot, I'm sorry, I don't have, like, a, you know, all of these examples of evolution in the fossil record. Because he was living at the... Guapo, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome, Guapo. <laughs> uh, he was working at the very birth of the field of paleontology. You know, paleontology as a word basically didn't exist yet. It's that early in the history of, of fossil science. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, nowadays, holy cow, we've got this tremendous wealth of information. Calling it Darwin's tree, like they did right here. Uh, you know, it's like... It's, it's like looking at modern psychology and going, oh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's all that Freud stuff. It's like, well, no. Sigmund Freud was, like, way at the very birth of this whole field. You know, there's so many things he didn't know. Like, they had no idea how the brain worked back then. <laughs> Darwin didn't know about genes. He didn't know about, you know, anagenesis versus cladogenesis. He didn't know about, you know, epigenetics. Didn't really know about convergent evolution. All these other things. Today we recognize we have so much more information, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Cosmos says evolution in terms of adapting or changing. Yeah, that's that's the engine of evolution, Cosmos. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, creatures adapting and changing. That's like that's the the very engine of evolution. Actually yeah. represents the history of life on Earth. Yeah, or ontogeny too, Tommy Platicus. Yeah, and a large yeah. Of evidence to refute intelligent design and support evolution was coming to light. Just yeah. Oh, this is beautiful. This is uh, Neil Shubin and Tiktaalik. I remember thinking to myself when all this was going on, where do they get a load of this? Because it's just so beautiful. <laughs> yes! Evidence for his idea of common ancestry would be unearthed in the form of transitional fossils. He didn't really have many back then, yeah. Hundreds of years, fish gave rise to land animals, as evolutionary theory predicts. We should find fossils of extinct creatures that are part fish and part land animal. Mm -hmm. In 1999, paleontologist Neil Shubin and his colleagues set out to find just such a creature. Hmm. What evolution enables us to do is to make specific predictions about what we should find in the fossil record. The prediction in this case is clear cut. That is, if we go to rocks of the right age and the rocks of the right type, we should find transitions between two great forms of life, between yep. fish an amphibian. Many scientists think life began in the water at least three and a half billion years ago. Probably, yeah. We're still figuring this out. More recently, about 375 million years ago. Much more recently. Holy cow. Nine tenths of the way to the present. Yeah. The tree of life branched as primitive fish evolved into amphibians, such as today's frogs and salamanders, which live part of their lives on land. Kind of. Armed Calling them amphibians kind of muddies the water a little bit, but yeah, okay, okay. With this prediction, Shubin and his colleagues organized an expedition to one of the most desolate places on Earth, the Canadian Arctic. 
about 500 miles from the North Pole. Interesting, Embervix. Huh. The right age are exposed. Yeah. And Cosmos's dictionary.com puts metamorphosis as being a synonym of evolution. Yeah, that's a dictionary website, Cosmos. It's not Oh boy. Yeah. I hope you're pointing out that it's wrong about that cuz yeah, metamorphosis is a change throughout an organism's lifespan. So like a butterfly going from an egg to a caterpillar to a chrysalis to a butterfly, that's metamorphosis. That's one individual organism. That's like it's this little this little egg here turns into this little caterpillar. It's the same it's the same individual. Let's call him let's say his name is uh I don't know. Let's say his name's Cosmos. Little little baby Cosmos right there. You know, hatches out of his egg and he turns into you know, he's a little caterpillar. He goes around, eats leaves and stuff like that. Forms a cocoon around himself. And then little Cosmos turns into a butterfly. That's metamorphosis. It's still Cosmos the whole time. It's that individual animal, you know? Evolution doesn't happen throughout an animal's lifespan. Individual animals do not evolve. That's not how it works. Creatures evolve over the generations. So, like, you are a little bit different from your parents. Just like I'm a little bit different from my parents. That's evolution, you know? Each generation is a little bit different. It changes over time, you know? That's evolution right there. So evolution is completely different from metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is one individual creature changing through its individual lifespan from the time that it's born to the time that it dies. That's metamorphosis in there. Or ontogeny, as we often talk about with dinosaurs. You know? You know, we talk about this all the time. Ontogeny. Little baby triceratops grows up. That's not evolution. What is that? Ontogeny. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, evolution happens between generations. Does that make sense? Ontogeny. Yeah. And a Labrador can evolve from being skittish to non-skittish. That's not evolution, Cadmus, no, no. That's changing over time. You know, that's, that's an individual creature changing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. And David DeLuna says, wait, no, evolution means change outside of biology? That's not true, David DeLuna, no. Wait, biology, you mean... Do you mean the field of biology? Because that's not right, no. Evolution is the underlying principle underneath biology, you know? It's... That's what holds the entire field of biology together, is that living things change over time, and they're related to each other. Because different creatures have evolved, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and evolution is a specific kind of change. Yeah, it's change over generations. So, like, if we look it up on, say, Wikipedia. Yeah. And here we go. In biology. So, it's not outside of bi biology, obviously. In biology... Evolution is the change in heritable characteristics of biological populations over successive generations. It's generation to generation changes. So an individual creature cannot evolve. This is why... Oh, goodness, chat. This is why I don't think... I don't know. I... I... Pokemon is a real bugbear of mine, you know? Uh, because I think it's, it's confused so many people about what evolution is. People think of evolution and they hear that word like, oh, for like in Pokemon, you know, it's completely different in <laughs> real life. Evolution is across generations. Pokemon don't evolve. That's completely wrong. I really, really wish they'd used a different word for that. If they'd called it metamorphosis, that would make a zillion times more sense. That would be correct. Calling it evolution? Incorrect. It's not what evolution is. 
They fundamentally misunderstand what evolution is there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. They ontogenize. There you go, Lenina. Yeah. I don't, I'm not trying to confuse anybody, though. It's metamorphosis, which is kind of like what uh, what ontogeny is. That's why I, that's why I picked the, the Pokemon evolution, uh, Pokemon music for this. It's not evolution. It's ontogeny. Ontogeny. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's not adaptation, Orchid Twilight. No, that's different. Well, thank you, Emma IRL. I appreciate that bit of encouragement. And I appreciate that follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Jurassic Park. Let's protect our fossils because if they're removed, America loses them forever. And Camilla Bobilla, thank you. B5 Fofilla, thank you for the B5 follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here, Camilla Bobilla. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I'm scrolling up, scrolling up. Uh, but yeah, Cosmos says, wouldn't a formal definition, be it in science or non-science, about changes over time? You're missing a. You're missing part of that sentence, Cosmos. I don't know what you're asking. Wouldn't a formal formal definition, be it in science or non-science, about changes over time? It's like you're missing a whole clause there. I don't. I don't know what you're asking, Cosmos. I want to. I, I legitimately want to answer your question in good faith. I, I really, really do. I don't know what you're asking though. Yeah. So I. I don't know. If we're talking about biological evolution, you know, lineages of organisms evolving over time. This is the definition that we're using here. This is a biologist definition. You know. The change in heritable characteristics of biological populations over successive generations. There you go. Um, does that make sense? I hope it does. Yeah. And Snowfall, done a Dino Redeem for much later. Uh, Thanatos Draco. Oh, interesting. Snowfall. We'll do that tomorrow. How's that sound? Snowfall. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and Pandamanda, hey, yo, to you too. Thanks for your confirmation. Thanks for your greeting. Welcome. So, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and there you go. Evolution via artificial selection. There you go, Amber Vix. Yeah. Um, and there you go, LT. I agree with you. Yeah. Different fields define things differently. And this is the thing when we're talking about, like, you know, science versus, like, creationism. Left and right, you know, you'll find that different terms that we as scientists use every day and talking to one another, those get, like, twisted by people who try to argue that that what we're doing somehow isn't real or, like, I don't know. Yeah. These are your Pokemon emails. There you go, Astronomy Show. I'm glad. I hope you're doing well, Astronomy Show. It's great to have you here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, anyway, let's, uh, let's continue this right here, here, uh, yeah, think life began in the water. At least probably, yeah, more recently, about 375 million years ago, the tree of life branched. Yep. And primitive fish evolved into amphibians. And we see this in the fossils. Yeah. Which live part of their lives on land. Armed with this prediction, and, and his colleagues organized RPG fan says it's RPG fan makes a great point here. If the term evolution means something to guitar manufacturers, we don't apply those definitions to biology. Biology isn't guitar manufacturing. This is true, RPG. Um <laughs> This is true. There might be like little ways that we can like we'd be like, well, we can maybe relate this to that, but it'd be a stretch, you know. Um, so yeah, you're totally right, RPG. Appreciate that. Yeah, and uh, and changes constant. There you go, Neil. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, holy cow. 
And that's the thing. That's why our definition of a species is squishy is because species change over time. You can't put it in a neat little box and expect it to stay still. It's going to move around, you know? It's going to change. Language evolves, you know? It Yeah, if you if you try and put yeah. Anyway, let, let's continue. Expedition to one of the most desolate places on earth, the yeah. Canadian Arctic, about 500 miles from the North Pole. So here is Neil Shubin. Neil Shubin came here to the Canadian Arctic, like one of the most remote places on our planet, in order to uh, to try and find fossils. He he made a prediction. He said, if if indeed land living animals, what we call tetrapods, if they evolved from fishes, like we think they did, then that transition must have happened within this time frame right here. And he says, well, within this time frame right here, there's only a few places around the world where you can find rocks that are of that specific age. The Canadian Arctic here is one of those places. So he brought a team there, and they went to look for fossils of this critter. There's a prediction made by science that here we're going to try and... If these things exist, this missing link, you know, between fishes and land-living tetrapods, if it exists anywhere, it might be here. So they went there and they dug... What do you think happened? Here, they hope to fill a gap in the branch of the evolutionary tree that leads yep. from primitive fish yeah. to animals with four limbs or tetrapods by finding a fossil of an animal that shared characteristics of both. Yep. But after three summers of digging through hundreds of tons of rock in this harsh environment, they had found little of interest. And there's some frosty grad students indeed, LT. Well, one of these days we'll watch a, a whole documentary about this. There's a, in fact, if anybody's really interested, holy cow. Uh, yeah. PBS has a whole documentary about this called Your Inner Fish with Neil Shubin. It goes into great depth about Tiktaalik and about. How you can look at your very own anatomy. Weird aspects, like weird things that are like kind of not ideal about our bodies that point to our fishy ancestry. It's really cool, so check it out. I really cannot recommend it highly enough. It's so good. So good. Uh, we've watched it multiple times on my channel before, but it's been a while. It's been about... I think the last time we watched it might have been when I was... I was hanging out with my mom and her sister, my Auntie Kathy, on my way out on a big road trip last summer. Those would have been June of 2022, so it was a good while ago. Anyway, check it out. Really, really good. Yeah. And uh, Ragnarokker wanted to know, how accurate are the Jurassic Park 3 Pteranodon? Uh, they do have teeth, which is really goofy because the word Pteranodon means wings with no teeth. Full of changing environments and occasional catastrophe, all species eventually become Glad to be here to yeah. smiley face. Thank you, original old dog, and thank you for the seven months of support. I really appreciate you, original old dog. Thank you, thank you for keeping me here on the air for the past seven months. It means a lot. It really does. Anyway, you're in a fish. Really, really excellent. You should check it out. And uh yeah, the pteranodon in uh in Jurassic Park 3. Yeah, I, I don't know. Terrain absolutely did not have teeth. The wings are also a little wonky, and I don't know. I'm not really a pterosaur expert, Ragnarokker. I work on dinosaurs. Yeah, there's there's some stuff that I would change about them. I don't know. If anything, the, the Pteranodon from, uh, from the Lost World Jurassic Park at the very end, like the final shot of the movie, that's more authentic in some ways, I think. But yeah, yeah. You also have an Auntie Kathy? Very cool RPG. Yeah, Auntie Kathy's are the best. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's because of a genetic mutation in their DNA. Well, it's because the, whoever was putting them together didn't. Uh, it's because the movie producers thought that they'd be scarier if they had teeth. That's why they have teeth. Um. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway. Yeah. 
Uh, and how prevalent feathers were in dinosaurs. LT. I've got a command about that, don't I? Uh, yeah. I think feathers are probably more common on dinosaurs than we realize. They might even go back to the very origin of dinosaurs. Thing is, we didn't recognize that dinosaurs had feathers until like 1995, 1996. And it's because nobody had really found fossils that were well preserved enough to have the feathers on them. There's going to be other groups of dinosaurs that had feathers. And we'll discover that and be surprised because we had no idea because nobody's found fossils that were well preserved enough. That will continue to happen. It could be that all dinosaurs ancestrally had feathers. We'll have to see, you know? Future discoveries will shine light on this, and, and then we'll know for sure. But yeah. Yeah. On oh, very cool astronomy show, a pressed penny souvenir machine. Astronomy show, that sounds awesome. You know I collect those. Very cool. Yeah. But yeah. Let's get back to this. Uh, so Neil Shubin and co. Here. There we go. A gap in the branch of the evolutionary tree that leads from primitive fish to animals with four limbs or tetrapods by finding a fossil of an animal that shared characteristics of both. But after three summers of digging <laughs> through hundreds of tons of rock in this harsh environment, they had found little of interest. They returned the next year for one last try. Money was running out. This was it. We were told this was our last year up there. Yep. And then in 2004, in the third day of the season, a colleague of mine was removing rock and discovered a little snout sticking out the side of the cliff, just like exactly like this. Oh, boy. And more ah. Rock and more rock. And it became clear that this was a snout of a flat-headed animal. And that's what yep. we knew. Flat-headed animal at 375 million years old. This is going to be something interesting. Oh yeah. Very interesting. Talic, yeah. Large freshwater fish in the language of the local Inuit people. Yep. And it's one of the most vivid transitional fossils ever discovered. It's beautiful. Holy cow. Fish. Yep. Over here you have a, a fish of about 380 million years old. And when you see just like any good fish, it has uh, scales on its back and mm -hmm. fins. You compare that to an amphibian, you find a creature uh, that doesn't have scales, and it's modified the fins mm. to become limbs, uh, arms and legs, and the head's very different. It has a flat head with eyes on top and a neck. What we see when we look at the fossil record, at rocks of just the right age, is a hmm. creature like Tiktaalik, just like a yep. fish. It has scales on its back and fins. You can see the fin webbing here. Beautiful. Look at the head. You see Exquisitely preserved. It's a very amphibian-like thing with a flat head with eyes on top. It gets even better when we take the fin apart. When we look inside the fin, as in this cast here, well, you'll see it as bones that compare to our shoulder, elbow, even parts of wrist. Bone <laughs> for bone. So you have a fish at just the right time in the history of life that has characteristics of amphibians and primitive fish. Exactly. As we would expect and to say. As evolutionary theory predicts, That's so cool. Tiktaalik suggests a tree of life with one yep. species giving rise to another over millions of years. Yes, indeed. The discovery of Tiktaalik was still being written up at the time of the trial, so yep. it couldn't be used as evidence. <laughs> but Shubin's colleague. <laughs> and here, so here's the guy in the reenactment here, dramatic, dramatic reenactment for this documentary. This guy's supposed to be Kevin Padian. You know, the, you, and longtime viewers of this stream know Kevin Padian. He's the guy with the, uh, the alert that pops up with the dirter, you know, thing that comes in the paper towels and you put it up to your mouth and you go, dirt, dirt, dirt. That's Kevin Padian. And, uh, you'll see him on here. And, uh. Hope he tells me you're one of these, uh, one of these archaeologist fellas. Well, he's pretty near the mark. Actually, I'm a paleontologist. Oh. We dig deeper. We you know, dig deeper. <laughs> Lordy, thank you, thank you for your raid. How are you doing, Lordy? How was your stream? I hope it was excellent. That's a big raid. 14 raiders. Welcome, welcome, everybody, to Paleontologizing. How did everything go, Lordy? I hope it was wonderful. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Um. Excellent. 
Yeah. Uh, so if anybody here is not yet following Lordy, you're missing out. If they're removed, America loses them forever. LT424, thank you, thank you for your Prime sub there. Exquisite. I really appreciate that. Thank you for your support. Thanks for supporting Science Outreach here on Twitch. It, it means a lot to me. It really does. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Lordy, how did your... Uh, how did your sewing go today? Lordy is making a jacket. A quilted jacket, if I remember correctly. Um, Lordy, you were talking about cutting out patterns for it. It sounded like a whole endeavor. But Lordy, not only does she do cooking, not only is she professionally trained as a baker and as a chef, she's also been sewing for a long time, and she makes custom clothing right there on Twitch. So if that sounds remotely interesting to you, you know? If you happen to be the sort of person who wears clothes, as some of us do, you know? Maybe go check out Lordy's channel. See if you might want to give her a follow. Always doing cool stuff. So, uh... Yeah. Yeah. And uh, make my first quilted coat today. Very exciting, Lordy. Very exciting. I hope it went really well. I hope you like the pattern so far. That's awesome. Lordy, we're talking about, once again... We're talking about evolution and... And people who try and keep it out of the schools, unfortunately. Um, yeah. So, this is a clip from the... Uh, that, uh, that documentary about the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial from 2005. And this guy, this actor, is standing in for paleontologist Kevin Padian, whom we'll also hear in a, see here in a minute. So, yeah. Paleontologist yeah. Kevin Padian showed the judge examples of other fossils with transitional features that support Darwin's tree of life. Yep. My testimony in the trial. So here's the actual Kevin Padian right here. Yeah. Was basically taking a day and showing the judge how we do our work and what the evidence is. Very cool. How dinosaurs evolved into birds. As yep. seen in creatures like Archaeopteryx, which has a long tail and teeth like a dinosaur, but feathers just like a modern bird. How ancestors of modern reptiles evolved into creatures now extinct that share a common ancestor with mammals. Yep. And how surprisingly whales evolved from large land animals that returned to the water yes and indeed his book says we can't go from a to b there, there are no fossils and we don't know how to study them actually we've gone from a to b and to c d e f and g we have the fossils we have the the, the transitional features we have the ways of analyzing them with many different lines of evidence and we're looking for the picture that accounts for the most lines of objective evidence yep yeah. With each fossil, there you go. Canadian refuted Panda's claim that different life forms <laughs> appear suddenly by showing how fossils of extinct organisms bridge the gaps between species, resulting in a picture of gradual evolution, just as Darwin proposed. This is grossly oversimplified here. There should be thousands upon thousands of fossils here, but they're just trying to make it real simple for the viewing audience. But holy cow, is it... <laughs> uh, crazy numbers of fossils we've got here. Um, yeah. Yeah. The reporters in the courtroom who were just... And, uh... Hang on. Yeah, hang on. Hang on. Uh, Cadmos says, why are some people... And hang on a minute here, too. Um, let's see. I think I can do... Uh, hang on a minute here. Come on, I'm concerned that you might get ads during this. And so... I can't gift you a sub. Do you already have a sub? You already have a sub. Okay, cool. I was going to gift you one, Cadmos. Anyway, because um, this is a good discussion we're having, I feel. Like, I, I feel like this is productive. This is why I'm here on Twitch in the first place, you know? This is why I do what I do, is I want to be an advocate for science, you know? Share my passion and my research with, with all of you. Like, yeah, I got to work on some more publications. When I say research, I mean, like, published papers. But, uh, 
I'm here to be an ambassador for science, you know? Kadmo says, why are some people so set on scientifically proving or disproving X? Because that's what science is. Science is about testing ideas, you know? Yeah. Can they accept that sometimes things can be taken by faith? Yeah, but not, not things about, like, science, you know? Yeah. It's like if, if we actually want to know the truth about something, like what really, really happened tens of millions of years ago, taking it on faith, you know, that might make somebody feel good, but it's not, you know. Science is about finding out what's true and more often what's false, you know? Most of science is about disproving ideas. It's because it's it's usually much more difficult to prove that something's true than to prove that it's false, you know? Falsification is one of the underpinnings of science. It's we test ideas and we it's process of elimination, you know? Like, uh, you know, did this happen? Well, we we test it and like this explanation doesn't work. That one doesn't work. That one doesn't work. And it's kind of like the last one standing is the one that we go with for now until somebody's able to disprove that, too. And then maybe there's another idea that actually fits fits it, you know, more precisely. And that's how we... That's eventually how we narrow things down. Think about it like trying to troubleshoot... Uh, say your dryer stopped working, you know? And you can't do laundry anymore. This happened to me just a couple months ago. I was without a dryer for like two months. <laughs> My landlord took, like, a long time to send a guy to fix it. But I tried to troubleshoot it beforehand, you know? And I could I could have taken it on faith, like, oh, you know, it's... I don't know, uh, the dryer's cursed or something. Or I could try to figure it out, you know? So I went over to the circuit breaker panel. I tried the circuit breakers, and... Yeah, it's not like it tripped the breaker, and that's why the dryer wasn't working. Breakers are all in the on position. I flipped them back and forth. Dryer still didn't work. Process of elimination. I checked the lint filter, the lint trap in the dryer. That was fine, you know? I, uh... I unplugged it and plugged it back in. It's like, you know, testing hypotheses. Hypothesis. Maybe the, the lint filter is just clogged, you know? Nope. Knock that out. It's all about testing. It's the same way when we're trying to figure out, you know... How living things evolve over time. You know, we test these ideas. That's that's what it's all about, you know. When we want, if we actually want to get to the truth of the matter, we test it. You know, that's that's the, that's the fundamental idea underneath science: testing ideas. You know. So yeah, and it's it's one of those things where you've got to you've got to set your ego aside, and you've got to. A good scientist, what is a good scientist like? She cares the most about what's true. You know, it's like she she very badly wants to know what the truth is. She might have a favorite idea that she is really attached to, but if her tests show that that idea doesn't work, she has to throw it away, you know? Or at least set it aside and test out some other ideas. Maybe they work better, you know? That's what science is all about. So yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. Anyway, I, I feel like I lost this in chat. Where were we? Um, but yeah. And, and Cadmo says, if a person is on a Christian mission trip to some indigenous tribal part of Mexico, uh, and they res... I don't know what you mean by that, but... They resurrect, bring someone back from the dead. A native who died of some illness. How can that be scientifically explained? Not sure it can. I mean, you'd have to prove that it happened first, you know? This is not like... You're saying, how can a, a miracle be proved? I mean, first you gotta show that it actually happened, you know? Um, is there video of this? You know? People make up stories about things all the time, and I don't mean to be a debunker about this. And go, like, 
you know, like, oh, well, well, picks or it didn't happen or something like that. You know, I, it's just, if you're, if you really, really care about whether or not something is true, if it's your primary purpose to figure out if something is true or not, then, you know, there's ways to demonstrate that, you know? You, you kind of have to accept that other people might be a little bit skeptical of that idea. And it's not because they're bad people. It's not because they hate you. It's not because they're against you or anything. It's just like... I don't know. Especially... I don't know. In our modern information age, there's just all of these people saying all of these things all the time, and they all contradict each other. It's like... If somebody makes an extraordinary claim, like, oh yeah, we brought this guy back from the dead, you know, by, uh, you know, we rubbed of, uh, I don't know, we, we took some flowers and we, uh, we threw them over his head and then he came back to life. It's like, well, shoot, that's a pretty extraordinary claim. They have a saying in the scientific community, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You know? If you're going to say something that's kind of off the wall, you got to show some really convincing proof of that. You know? Like, shoot, if I were to tell you right now that right now I have a dozen bull African elephants here in my office right now, and, uh, they're, they're right here, and they're alive, they're, they're sleeping right there, you know? That's a pretty extraordinary claim, right? You could take it on faith that it's true, but, like, it doesn't matter how honest I am, what a reputation for genuineness I might have. If you say, oh, well, that sounds really cool, can I see him? And I go, no, you can't see him. Sorry, just have to trust me. Yeah, you'd be a little bit suspicious, right? If all I have to do is turn the camera and show you the elephants? Is this a good analogy? I hope it is. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, you know? So yeah, yeah. That's what sets science apart from other ways, ways of knowing, I guess. You know, science is about providing evidence. Testing things, you know? That's why it's the best method that we have for figuring out what's true and what's not. You know? Is that making sense? I hope it is. So yeah, and it is a Sagan quote. There you go, Astronomy Show. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I dig that Sagan emote. Good stuff. So anyway. Uh, but let's see. Cadmos says, okay, say that there was video evidence of the person dying and video evidence of a person being brought back. Neither was staged in any sense of the word. Then, uh, fantastic. That's an excellent discovery. Let's do it some more. You know? Another key thing in science is reproducibility. You know? If something's real, if a phenomenon is real, you should be able to do it more than once. You know? Like, I don't know. You wouldn't buy a microwave oven if... Uh, if it might only heat up food one time. You know, if something's real, if it's a real phenomenon, you should be able to figure out how it works and be able to do it again, you know? Otherwise, there might be some kind of trickery involved. So if a, if a friend of mine, if, say, she came back from Mexico and she had cell phone video of someone being brought back from the dead or something like that, I would say, hey... You know, I love you, you're my friend. That's a wild claim. Shoot. Like, do you have EKG, EKG readings of that person? Like, their heart rate and stuff like that? Do you know they were actually dead? Like, what's the process for you bringing them back to life? You know, these are questions that a scientist would have. You know? That's how we're able to spot fake stuff and figure out what's real. You know, these are like, this is, this is fundamental to the scientific method. So yeah, 
Yeah. Um. So anyway, anyway. Uh. uh there's only eleven. <laughs> only eleven elephants. There you go. Um. <laughs> can we see the elephants? You can't, Oscar Juniors. I'm not going to show you. Because they're not real. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. So yeah, here. Let's, I, we need to get back to the video here. Um, because we haven't even gotten to the point that I was trying to find about Kevin Padian talking about how this stuff gets left out of textbooks because creationists fight so hard to keep it out. Yeah. Fossils with transitional features here. that can be used as evidence. But Shubin's colleague, paleontologist Kevin Padian, showed yeah. examples of other fossils with transitional features that support Darwin's tree of life. My testimony in the trial was basically taking a day and showing the judge how we do our work and what the evidence is. How dinosaurs evolved into birds. Yeah, we talk about this all the time. Like Archaeopteryx, some yep. modern bird. Yep. Extinct that share a common ancestor with mammals. Mm -hmm. And how surprisingly, whales evolved from large land animals that yep. returned to the water. True. And where the pandas book says we can't go from A to B. So the pandas book that he's talking about is the creationist book of pandas and people, which is what the... Uh, that's what, like, the creationists were trying to push into public school classrooms. And it's like a creationist textbook. Um, so th yeah, that's what, that's what Kevin is talking about. Whales evolved from large yeah. animals that returned to the water. And where the pandas book says we can't go from A to B. There, there are no fossils and we don't know how to study them. Actually, we've gone from <laughs> A to B and to C, D, E, F, and G. Yep. We have the fossils. We have the fossils. The, the transitional features. We have the ways of analyzing them with many different lines of evidence. And we're looking for the picture that accounts for the most lines of objective evidence. Yeah. With each fossil, Padian refuted Panda's claim that different life forms appear suddenly by showing how fossils of extinct organisms bridge the gaps between species. Yep. Resulting in a picture of gradual evolution. This is super oversimplified, but yeah. The reporters in the courtroom who were just amazed that we knew all this stuff and how come they hadn't learned about this stuff before. And the reason is, it's not in textbooks because the creationists fight so hard to keep it out. That's been a big influence. The court yep, absolutely. This is the clip. That's the clip I was trying to show you right there. I'll show you one more time, but this, this is what I'm trying to do here on Twitch, you know? This is this is what I'm all about, is is trying to, to share this knowledge of, of fossil science with anybody who will listen. Because we as fossil scientists know all about this. Other people in the scientific community are at least kind of obliquely aware of this. But the general public usually doesn't get to hear about this kind of thing. You know? I never learned about evolution in school until college. I'd read a million books on evolution, you know, when I was in school before that. So I knew a lot about it, but most people are not like this, you know? Yeah, yeah. If if school is supposed to prepare people for... You know, if it's supposed to give them some sort of basic understanding of the world around them... You know, it's failing people here in the U.S. When it comes to biology. Evolution is the fundamental underlying principle in biology. That, hey, living things change over time. That's why we've got so many weird and wild different critters around is because, you know, because of branching evolution like that. We know this is a fact in biology, but it's not being taught in schools, you know? It would be like, like offering physics classes, but refusing to mention the idea of gravity. It's verboten, forbidden, you, you can't talk about it, you know? That's what it's like in biology. And it's nuts. It's really crazy. So, yeah. Again, here's Kevin Padian talking about that. The reporters yeah. in the courtroom were just amazed that we knew all this stuff. And how come...
they hadn't learned about this stuff before. And the reason is, it's not in textbooks because the creationists fight so hard to keep it out. That's been yep. a big influence. The court. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Anyway. So Cosmos, I'm glad you're here, and I don't mean to put you on the spot. I hope. I hope everybody kind of learned something today. I don't know. I certainly learned some stuff today about um, Afro-theor, like, relationships between different Afro-theors. I learned that the, uh, the suction cup on the top of a remora fish's head is actually a modified dorsal fin. I never knew that before. I learn something every time I stream here, and that's... It's such a, a joy and an honor and a privilege to be able to do this. And uh, I can't tell you how much this means to me, everybody. Seriously. Um, such a joy, such a joy to be able to do this. So anyway, Amelia Bedelia, holy cow, says, I've learned more here than I ever did in school. Thank you, Danny. Oh, that, that makes my heart sing, Amelia. Thank you, thank you for saying so. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, with that said, it is now time for us to wrap up this broadcast. So let's do that with an Archaeopteryx there to run our credits over. Don't go away just yet, though, everybody. We're going to go raid into Phaseria's channel. We've never raided Phaseria before, but she's doing some microscopy right now. She's a big-time streamer. This is going to be awesome. Phaseria. F-A-E-Z-A-R-I-A. Bow. There we go. Thank you, thank you, everybody, for everything on today's broadcast. Thank you. If the dinosaurs had not died, perhaps in some catastrophe, no reason to think dinosaurs wouldn't still be here. Shimarisu. Dominating the Earth. Shimarisu, thank you so much for your follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. I hope to see you tomorrow, maybe. I stream every weekday at 2 p.m. California time. 2 p.m. Pacific. Talking about fossil news, new discoveries. And holy cow. What havoc will they wreak? What lives will they destroy? What depths of panic and terror will they create? Holy cow. Chris Nova, thank you, thank you for your raid. Chris Nova, we were just about to raid out too. Chris Nova, thank you, thank you for your raid. I really appreciate that. I'm not cool, thank you for the follow. I'm sure you are cool. You're here and you just followed. That's some indication. Appreciate you, cool. And uh, Chris Nova, raid out. Uh, it'd be a double rainbow. There we go. We will. On formal occasions, he's called And thank you, Carl Bright, for your follow. Madoc Vaur. Appreciate that, both of you. Thank you for following. If anybody's new here, I'm Danny. I work on dinosaurs. I dig up dinosaurs. I study them. I talk about them here on Twitch. And we're trying to raid out to Faye's area, who's doing some microscopes, micro, microscopy stuff, microscope work. Anyway, I'll be streaming again tomorrow like I do every weekday, 2 p.m. California time. Bring your dinosaur questions then. We've got some dinosaur deep dives to go over then. Chinese dinosaurs for Orchid Twilight. We're going to be talking about... I'll have to review them, but we've got more dinosaur deep dives. It's going to be real good. So anyway, again... Credits. Uh, thank you, thank you to everybody who contributed. Whether it was by rating, like you, Chris Nova, thank you, thank you. Where's our credits? Come on, credits. You can do it. And thank you, Travel the World, for gifting Chris Nova. I really appreciate that travel. Thank you, thank you. That is excellent. Here's our credits. Want to give credit where credit is due. Thank you, everybody, for all of your support on today's broadcast. It means the world to me, and I would not be able to do what I do without your help. So, uh, seriously. Whether you cheered with bits, whether you moderated, thank you, mods. Whether you followed today. Uh, or whether you just chatted or lurked or asked questions or whatever. I appreciate all of you 
tremendously. Really extraordinary. And Argenberry, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Uh, excellent stuff. And Farf is back too. How are you doing, Farf from Groovin? Welcome, welcome. We're going to go right into Phaseria. Uh, she's doing some microscope work. It's going to be excellent. We've never raided her before, but she's like a big time streamer. I'm sure she'll appreciate a raid from us. It's going to be good stuff. Uh, and what is that, that she's looking at? Some kind of little squirmy guy? Oh, it's going to be cool. Anyway, thank you, thank you. Ask her to see, ask to see her geckos. Green Bam knows something I don't. Geckos, I love geckos. Some of my favorite lizards. Anyway, thank you, thank you, everybody. I'm streaming again tomorrow, 2 p.m. California time. If you've got dinosaur questions, bring them then. Right now, we're going to raid into phase area. I will see you there, everybody. Thank you for everything. Bye-bye.